Good morning, everybody. I welcome you on behalf of the Center of International Dispute Resolution at Butzeris Law School and the other organizers of this conference, the University of Hamburg, the University of Sao Paulo, and the United Nations UNCTRAL to this conference on arbitration and insolvency. Um, the, normally, the first words would have belonged to our president, who unfortunately cannot make it today due to the well-known virus which is flying around here. Um, but she will give you a short welcoming address after my opening remarks. Arbitration and insolvency, there's a famous quote from the Second Circuit, uh, which once said, I quote now, they present a conflict of near-polar extremes. Bankruptcy policy exerts inexorable pull towards centralization, while arbitration policy advocates a decentralized approach towards dispute resolution. Today, we are trying to look at some of these conflicting policies. And we try to take an international look and also take a look both from the practice side as well as the academic side. We will start off with an introduction, not by Professor Flöter. That is the problem always if you invite practitioners, in particular insolvency administrators. There may always be a, a big insolvency coming and requiring your presence immediately. But we are very glad that he had sent his assistant, um, Ms. Gelbrich here, who will present uh, the views of the practitioner. She is also a well-known practitioner, but Professor Borg will give you some more details about that. And then we start looking at a broad overview on topics both from the European side as well as from the Latin American side. To then have a look at some of the more specific problems which always arise in practice, uh, the scope of the arbitration agreement uh, in particular, the scope in relation to the persons, the arbitration or the insolvency administrator, but then also in relation to some of the very specific insolvency rights. To go on later, after lunch, what happens if the insolvency or can the insolvency administrator enter into arbitration agreements after he or she has been appointed? And the final part will be the international part, where we have a look at some of the rules of UNCTRAL dealing with international cross-border insolvency and uh, conflict of laws in insolvency. Well... Good morning, everybody. Also from my side, a warm welcome, and uh, it's a privilege to be here. Um, I have to say, in my, in my experience as an arbitration practitioner, arbitration rarely tends to be boring. But what I can say is that when uh, insolvency matters come into play, they certainly are everything than boring and uh, um, can tend to be quite mind-boggling. Um, and uh, today's conference covers the various aspects that come into play in this context. And our first session deals with some fundamental issues. And uh, the first part of it uh, concerns the issue arbitrability of insolvency-related uh, claims and other um, restrictions, the general approach. And we will hear an overview over various jurisdictions on the topics that are at play. Um, and uh, we will first have Professor Borg um, uh, presenting the legal situation in Germany and then uh, also on uh, selected other European jurisdictions, uh, followed by Professor Satiro, who will uh, cover uh, the legal situation in Brazil and further other selected jurisdictions. In the second part, we will then have Dr. Penades, who will deal with the scope of the arbitration clause ratio personae. Um, and before giving the floor to Professor Borg, let me first briefly introduce the speakers uh, for the first part. Um, first, we have Professor Reinhard Borg, who was a professor at Hamburg University since 1990 for civil procedural law and general procedural law. And uh, Professor Borg, uh, presents a rare combination of um, uh, academic expertise and vast practical experience as arbitrator. And the first time we encountered was when I was appearing as counsel in an arbitration um, that had such mind-boggling 
uh, insolvency-related problems uh, at the core of the dispute, and uh, I had, we had uh, Professor Borg as one of the arbitrators. Um, he's, he also acted as a part-time judge at the, higher, um, at the Hanseatic Higher Regional Court, so the Hamburg Court of Appeals, um, and he also spent two years, uh, not in a row, but two separate years in Oxford, um, where, as he told me, he broadened his uh, perspective from the domestic perspective to the really international perspective. Um, these are just a few highlights um, worth mentioning from his impressive CV. Um, and then we will have a similarly uh, impressive person presenting the, giving the second presentation, that is Professor Francesco Satino, um, who is a professor for business, uh, a professor at the Business Law School at Sao Paulo University, um, who is specialized in corporate finance law, capital markets regulation, and um, insolvency law. He was a visiting professor at universities in an impressive number of jurisdictions covering Colombia, Mexico, Portugal, and the Italy and the UK, and from 2011 to 2015, he was a member of the National Council of Appeals uh, on the financial system in Brazil. And then from 2016 on, he was appointed by the Ministry of Economy to draft the amendment of the Brazilian insolvency law. So we do have two excellent speakers, and uh, there's no need for me to stand between you and their presentations, except for one housekeeping issue that I would like to suggest is maybe we hear you, your both presentations first and then we collect the questions and have a round of questions afterwards if that's convenient to you. Excellent. Then, Professor Bach, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for your kind and flattering introductory remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, the question of arbitrability of insolvency-related claims is a topic that is as important as it is controversial. The answers offered diverge not only between different jurisdictions, but also within a single jurisdiction. My task is to shed some light on this problem by introducing typical national solutions. So now I need um, the remote. Uh, this one, yeah. Wonderful. Let us start with a typical case. Prior to the opening of insolvency proceedings, the debtor has purchased a production machine and has paid a part of the purchase price. The sales contract contains an arbitration clause which covers all disputes arising from or in connection with this contract. Meanwhile, insolvency proceedings have been commenced and an insolvency practitioner has been appointed. The insolvency practitioner challenges the payments made by the debtor to the vendor as preferences. Since the vendor who has already delivered the machine refuses to satisfy the transaction's avoidance claims, the insolvency practitioner considers litigation. Vice versa, the vendor demands payment of the remaining purchase price. The question arises whether these claims can be brought in state court, which the insolvency practitioner would prefer, or whether arbitration must be invoked, which the opponent would prefer. Dealing with the answer illustrates the obstacles to arbitration in insolvencies. First, there must be a valid arbitration clause between the procedural parties. In our Example case, the parties to the sales contract, debtor and creditor, have agreed on such an arbitration clause. However, the opening of insolvency proceedings against the vendee raises various questions. Has the arbitration clause survived the opening of these proceedings? If so, is the insolvency practitioner bound to it? And if so, is he or she entitled to extraordinarily terminate the arbitration agreement? Second, the arbitration agreement must cover the subject matter of the dispute. 
This depends firstly on the wording of the arbitration clause. Transactions avoidance claims, for example, are certainly not claims arising from the underlying contract, but only claims arising in connection with the purchase agreement at most. Secondly, if the arbitration clause is wide enough, one must establish whether the claims in question are arbitrable at all, i.e., is it objectively possible to submit these claims to an arbitral tribunal? And if so, did the debtor subjectively have the power to include these claims in his or her arbitration agreement, or is this the exclusive power reserved for the insolvency practitioner? It is not possible to deal with all these questions extensively in my talk, since my speaking time is limited to 20 minutes. Fortunately, it is also not necessary to deal with all these questions extensively, since all of them are covered by more specific talk presented by other speakers during this conference. Hence, I restrict my observations to the last topic, the arbitrability of insolvency-related claims. Let me start with two definitions. We need to be clear about the meaning of the term arbitrability and insolvency-related claims. The term arbitrability is easy to define. It means that the subject matter of the dispute can be brought before an arbitral tribunal, provided, of course, there is a valid arbitration agreement covering the subject matter. Arbitrability, also referred to as uh, objective arbitrability or arbitrability ratione materiae, is a substantive characteristic of the subject matter in dispute and must be neatly separated from the arbitration agreement. The party's power to dispose of the subject matter also referred to as subjective arbitrability and other prerequisites of the tribunal's jurisdiction. For example, as we will see in a moment, transactions avoidance law is objectively arbitrable in many jurisdictions, but subjectively the arbitration agreement must be entered into by the insolvency practitioner. Since it is far from clear what insolvency-related claims are, this approach needs clarification too. Even if we must be clear that insolvency-related claims is not a legal term, but only the exact delimitation of my subject. In a recent paper of Insol International, Paul Heath and Anna Kirk have suggested that the key feature of determining insolvency-related claims is the fact that a debtor was not able to bring the claim before he or she entered insolvency proceedings. This definition is not a hard and fast rule. However, at least it allows us to separate clear cases from the less clear ones. In this re respect, the following can be said. First, it is generally agreed that decisions managing the insolvency proceedings themselves are not arbitrable at all. This concerns, among others, the decision to open such proceedings, to appoint an insolvency practitioner, to give directions to the insolvency practitioner, to decide on insolvency and restructuring plans, and to terminate the proceedings. Second, in most jurisdictions, claims stemming from the underlying contract are not insolvency-related claims where, for example, the debtor has already delivered the goods purchased by the counterparty and the insolvency practitioner demands payment, this claim is a pre-insolvency claim. If it was arbitrable before the opening of the insolvency proceedings, it does not lose its arbitrability upon the opening of the insolvency proceedings. A different question is whether the arbitration agreement continues to exist and binds the insolvency practitioner, but that is not a problem of arbitrability of the contractual claim. The same holds true for the reverse constellation. If the counterparty has delivered and demands payment from the insolvency practitioner, this claim is arbitrable before the commencement of the proceedings, 
just as it is arbitrable after the commencement of the insolvency proceedings. There may be other obstacles resulting from the respective national insolvency law. For example, in many jurisdictions, creditor claims must be filed with the insolvency practitioner or the court, and creditors must wait with the lawsuit, including arbitration, until it is clarified whether this filing is objected. Whether this lawsuit can be arbitration depends on national law. In some jurisdictions, decisions on disputed creditor claims are binding not only on the procedural parties, but also on the debtor and all other creditors. In the case of arbitration, this might be an obstacle since the award would be binding on persons who are a party neither to the arbitration agreement nor to the arbitral proceedings. However, this is a serious hurdle on the road to an arbitral award, but it is not a problem of arbitrability. Third, typical insolvency-related claims are those which are triggered by the opening of the insolvency proceedings. Examples are claims, from, for, uh, claims for restitution or compensation stemming from transactions avoidance law, and claims for damages resulting from directors' liability for wrongful trading. Admittedly, this classification is dependent on national laws. For example, in some jurisdictions, creditors are entitled under national law to ch challenge legal acts intentionally defrauding or disadvantaging creditors outside insolvency proceedings. In Roman law, this basic appearance of the Actio Pauliana was part of tort law, and this has survived in various jurisdictions, for example, in France or in Spain. However, these are exceptions, and in most jurisdictions, the Actio Pauliana, with its three typical manifestations, preferences, transactions, transactions at an undervalue, and transactions intentionally disadvantaging creditors, are nowadays an inherent part of insolvency law, and the claims for restitution or compensation do not exist outside insolvency proceedings. They are therefore insolvency-related claims within the meaning of the topic of my talk. Against this background, we can now turn to the legal analysis of insolvency-related claims pursued in arbitration proceedings. Under the heading of arbitrability, the question is whether arbitral tribunals have jurisdiction to deal with insolvency-related claims, and it can be shown that national laws take very different approaches here. In some jurisdictions, there are explicit provisions that address our issue. For example, in Latvia, Section 5, Para 1, Number 8 of the Arbitration Act denies the arbitrability of rights and obligations of persons who have entered into insolvency proceedings. This is construed narrowly and does also exclude arbitration agreements between the insolvency practitioner and the recipient of avoidable transactions. Hence, transactions avoidance claims are not arbitrable in Latvia. The same holds true for Portugal. Here, Article 87 of the Insolvency Act provides that, I quote, arbitration agreements to which the insolvent is a party concerning disputes whose outcome may influence the value of the insolvency estate shall be suspended, end of quote, provided that the arbitral proceedings are not yet pending at the date of the commencement of the insolvency proceedings. Under this rule, arbitration concerning insolvency-related term claims can neither be based on an arbitration agreement concluded by the debtor prior to the insolvency proceedings, nor on an arbitration agreement concluded by the insolvency practitioner after the opening of insolvency proceedings. In Poland, however, Article 147A of the Polish Bankruptcy Act entitles the insolvency practitioner to withdraw from any arbitration agreement under certain conditions provided that the arbitration has not yet been initiated. Vice versa, the insolvency practitioner may stick to the arbitration clause and may also conclude an ad hoc agreement with the obligor of an insolvency-related claim. This follows not only in Poland, but also in other jurisdictions such as Germany or Italy, 
from provisions which require the consent of a creditors committee for submitting a dispute to an arbitral tribunal. Finally, and for delimitation purposes only, in many jurisdictions, there is a norm that assigns dispute over insolvency-related claims to the exclusive jurisdiction of the insolvency court, frequently under the principle of vis attractiva concursus. However, it is widely held, although not without exceptions, that such provisions only regulate the jurisdiction of the state courts and do not exclude arbitration proceedings. Most national insolvency and arbitration laws are silent on the relationship between arbitration and insolvency. Hence, it is for the courts to decide on this matter. However, as Gary B. Bourne puts it, I quote, different nat national legislative regimes and judicial decisions have reached different conclusions about these types of dispute, end of quote. This shall be illustrated by some selected examples. According to the case law of the German Bundesgerichtshof, Federal Court of Justice, the legal situation in Germany can be summarized as follows. First, arbitration agreements concluded by the debtor are principally binding on the insolvency practitioner, who is not entitled to terminate the agreement under the rules on executory contracts. Second, this does not include arbitration if the subject matter of the dispute is an independent right of the insolvency practitioner, which is beyond the debtor's power of disposal. Typical examples are transactions avoidance claims and the insolvency practitioner's right to choose non-performance of executory contracts. However, since the insolvency practitioner has the power of disposal of these subject matters, it is generally agreed that he or she may accept arbitration independently from the debtor's decision. It follows from this that under German law, arbitration regarding insolvency-related claims is a matter of the party's subjective power to conclude an arbitration agreement rather than of the objective arbitrability of these subject matters. In England, case law on the arbitrability of insolvency-related claims is under development. In Larsen versus uh, Petroprot, the Singapore Court of Appeal held that, first, the phrase all disputes in an arbitration clause did not extend to the transactions avoidance claims resulting from a transaction at an undervalue, as it could not be assumed that the parties would have intended claims by a liquidator, liquidator post-insolvency be within the clause. And second, in any event, the claims were not arbitrable on public policy grounds because they affected not just the parties but also other unsecured creditors. And third, that the insolvency regimes override the freedom of the company's pre-insolvency management to choose the forum where disputes on insolvency-related claims are to be heard. This reasoning is partly surprising. Firstly, it is a principle of English law to construe arbitration clauses liberally. And secondly, it is difficult to see how a transactions avoidance claim could affect the rights of other creditors. However, the judgment addresses at least the really important point, namely the debtor's power of disposition. It does not come as a surprise that the High Court of England and Wales refused to follow this decision decision. In Norrie Holding, the High Court stated with, in my impression, harsh words that the decision in Larsen was irreconcilable with the decision of the House of Lords in Fiona Trust and did therefore, I quote, not form part of English law, end of quote. Instead, the court held that transactions avoidance claims resulting from a transaction at an undervalue were caught by an arbitration clause which refers to, I quote, any dispute or disagreement arising under or in connection with the underlying contract, end of quote. 
The court also assessed the respective claim as being arbitral, regardless of whether the claim is properly characterized as an insolvency claim or not. What mattered to the judge was that the claim was based on the claimant's allegation that valuable security rights were fraudulently replaced by worthless security rights, a dispute which, according to the judge, I quote, arbitrators can determine, end of quote. However, it is respectfully submitted that this view misses the real point. Ultimately, it is not a question of the objective arbitrability of the avoidance claims, but of the debtor's subjective legal power to dispose of, the, dispose of them in advance, i.e. prior to the opening of insolvency proceedings. The same must be said against the decision in River Rock. Here again, the court declared the decision in Larsen to be not part of English law, as regards arbitrability, the court found that transactions avoidance claims are within the ambit of the arbitration clause and arbitrable despite their nature of insolvency-related claims, since this characterization did not render the claims automatically non-arbitrable. The judge also addressed the question of power of disposal by saying, I quote, I find the suggestion that the court should not allow the pre-insolvency management to determine the forum in which a liquidator could bring post-insolvency claims on the company's behalf less persuasive on this issue than the Singapore Court of Appeal did. In particular, it would seem to be limited to those cases in which the arbitration clause appears in a contract between the company and its management or vehicles associated with them and in which the circumstances in which the arbitration agreement had been concluded did not themselves provide as basis for impugning that agreement, end of quote. However, this is besides the point and anything but convincing because it is difficult to see how an arbitration agreement between the company and its management could impact transactions avoidance claims against a satisfied creditor. Again, the decisive question is not whether insolvency-related claims are objectively arbitrable, but whether the debtor can subjectively include such claims in a pre-insolvency arbitration agreement binding on the insolvency practitioner. In summing up, then, the following can be said subject to deviating regulations of the respective national law. First, Insolvency-related claims are objectively arbitral. Secondly, the insolvency practitioner may conclude an ad hoc arbitration agreement regarding such claims. Third, pre-insolvency arbitration agreements concluded by the debtor, provided they survive the opening of insolvency proceedings, cover insolvency-related claims if the wording is wide enough. Fourth, it is doubtful whether the debtor has subjectively the legal power to dispose of post-insolvency claims and rights by including them in a pre-insolvency arbitration agreement. Many thanks for your attention. Well, good morning to everybody. Thank you very much for having me here today. It's my pleasure, it's a huge pleasure to be here at, in Hamburg, at Buserius, uh, as part of an invitation from uh, Stefan Groh and uh, Professor Heinrich Borg, um, some two people that I uh, deeply admire, and to share the opportunity to talk about insolvency and arbitration with such a, a wonderful scholars and professionals. It's really a pleasure. And it seems to me, and I'm, I'm, I'm with this, I'm, I'm inviting Stefan and Heiner for that, that maybe 
um, this event could be the seed for something more ambitious like a, a book or something like that. Um, I think we are starting to discuss very interesting points here. And of course, there is one book that is uh, uh, remarkable in this area, uh, Professor Vesna. But um, probably some of the points, the aspects that will be discussed here will be discussed here um, as, uh, in, a, in, a, in a global way. Uh, that will probably probably be interesting to to keep a record of that. Well, uh, my task here was to talk about uh, how things work in Brazil, how insolvency and arbitration actually interact um, uh, in in Brazil, and I'd like to start by. Uh, mentioning that it's that uh, arbitration is traditionally a mean to solve dispute between two parties the rights in dispute shall be disposable and the parties have the option to define many of the aspects that will lead to the solution the arbitrator or arbitrators uh, the procedure time lapses discovery Etc. And confidentiality. Confidentiality is important. Confidentiality, confidentiality is a rule, as the solution of the disputed matter generally only interests the involved parties. Well, most of those aspects seems to lack when considering insolvency procedures. Insolvency proceedings have completely different foundations. They involve a debtor, or even eventually more than one, and many creditors. The creditors will fight for an optimization of the debtor's asset to ensure they will receive an amount as close as possible of what their original credit was. But in some way, creditors will compete among themselves for larger slice of the pie. As you can note, insolvency is about implementing an organized structure to prevent the competition among creditors and individual action against the debtor. Therefore, debtor's asset can be efficiently liquidated. Creditors will receive their uh, Credits respected the waterfall of preferences. This is the most simple description of liquidation, but reorganization, that's the other face of the same problem, will require many of those foundations. Well, even if one consider the traditional American explanation of reorganization as a creditor's bargain. The bargain in this expression, the expression, it's just a theoretical assumption. Uh, there is a presumption that that would be the bargain that the creditors would have chosen if there was no cost of transaction costs for them to uh, solve the problem and then to keep the ongoing concern value of the debtor's as asset. The fact is um, a huge part of insolvency proceeding procedures are not disposable, are not part of a creditor's agreement, but it's imposed by the state as a way to align creditors, align debtors, and provide a more efficient solution. Well, that, that brings up an apparent contradiction between those two institutes. 
but that apparent contradiction does not prevent the use of arbitration in insolvency. We have just heard two wonderful speeches here, and both then demonstrated that arbitration is a very important tool to improve the results of um, insolvency procedures. Well, I will quickly address here, within my 20 minutes, how this issue has been seen in Brazil. First point is that case law in Brazil has always, I would say has, has always, but it's since 2005 when we had a new law on bankruptcy. So since 2005, case law has uh, largely favored arbitration in insolvency in procedure. It's an interesting position because both in liquidation and in reorganizations, uh, the last one as a result of uh, case law, uh, the universal judge is um, a reality. So law says that the judge that is responsible for the case, uh, judge that is in charge for the main proceeding, shall decide the related cases. And well, if you, if one, um, concentrates power to decide in one specific person with jurisdiction, it's quite difficult to understand how could you share that or break that rule in order to allow arbitrators or arbit arbitrate tribunals to do the same. But that's what happens. And that became a statute, that became a statutory law uh, in 2020, almost two years ago, exactly two years ago. Well, how arbitration is seen in Brazil? Pre-petition arbitration proceedings. <clears throat> the opening of an insolvency proceeding, liquidation or reorganization, no matter, does not authorize the court appointed insolvency a judicial administrator or insolvency um, practitioner or trustee, depends on, on how you prefer to call it, to deny the effects of an arbitration agreement and does not prevent or suspend the commencement of an arbitral proceedings. Actually, since 2020, section six of our bankruptcy law has one specific paragraph that says, the commencement of a judicial reorganization or the issuance of a winding up order neither permit the trustee liquidator to discharge the arbitration agreement nor prevent or stay arbitrations from starting or continuing. So it's a very straight rule. It's a very straight decision, very strong, and it's been uh, perfectly uh, used in Brazil. Um, competence, competence. Competence, competence, we know is a, uh, an important point in arbitration. That means that uh, the arbitrators shall decide if they have competence, if, if what they are going to decide is uh, under their power as um, uh, competence. Well, the Brazilian Superior Court of Justice has interpreted that if both a judicial court and b an arbitral tribunal declare themselves to have jurisdiction to rule over the same controversy, or if both render conflicting decisions about the same issue, it's possible to file an application um, in a bad translation would be a conflict of jurisdiction application, 
before the Brazilian Superior Court of Justice to allow the court to decide whether the judicial court or the arbitral tribunal has jurisdiction over the issue. And there are some rulings about that. There are some cases that have been decided. Um, what I intend to, to tell you about that is that, well, there is competence, competence, but judiciary, but superior courts decided that if there is any doubt, so the superior court will have the final decision, not the arbitrators, nor the, uh, uh, the court, the court of insolvency. Proof of claims. Uh, proof of claims are a problem, a problem in, in Brazilian insolvency. Generally, there are many, many proof of claims as related procedures in one insolvency procedure. Just to give you an example, one of the most important cases in Brazil, now it's not a larger case, but it, once it was, uh, OI case. OI is a telecommunication company that filed for reorganization and is now reorganized. Uh, probably this month the procedure will, will finish. But just this, this sole procedure, OI case, has 61,000 proof of claims. It's absolutely impossible for a judge to decide 61,000 related procedures. And how, how does it happen? How this problem is solved in Brazil? Uh, most of them will never be decided. So um, any preliminary injunction or any um, apparent, uh, uh, proof will prevail and the credit will remain the same without a final judgment. Uh, uh, recently, courts decided that proof of claims can be uh, decided by um, arbitration. Parties can choose arbitration to decide a proof of, of claim. And arbitration will be mandatory if the contract providing grounds for the claim had an arbitration agreement or arbitration clause. Arbitration can decide the existence, validity, and or amount of the claim. Preferences are public policies issues. So uh, the arbitrators are not allowed to define in which class of creditors that specific credit shall be included. So they can say, well, this is a, a credit, it's one million whatever, and it's okay, it's a valid credit, it exists and it's valid, and the judge will decide uh, about priority. Uh, <clears throat> This is not the only case. I worked in a case um, a few years ago where there was a, a deposit of a certain amount and the discussion was uh, would that deposit be part of debtor's assets or would that deposit uh, be part of uh, the creditor's asset because it was a sort of collateral of one, of one specific contract that a debtor had with the creditor. Um, that would be a question involving decision about an asset that could be considered to be an asset of the debtor, debtor's assets. And even in that case, uh, the courts uh, sustained the decision of the arbitration tribunal. Um, so what demonstrates that at this point, 
uh, Brazilian courts are very keen with, um, with uh, arbitration, especially because they are uh, completely overloaded with cases and with things to decide. So arbitration and mediation seem to be a very important way to solve this, this um, uh, organization problem in Brazil. Stay. Does stay affect arbitration? Theoretically, the answer is no. Why no? Why not? Because stay will usually uh, refers to a decision and not to enforcement. Stay in Brazil will affect enforcement. Uh, what happens is during the arbitration, the tribunal provides a arbitration award, and this award shall be enforced before the judiciary. So the stay will affect the enforcement, but the stay will not affect uh, the decision related to the amount of the credit. So stay will probably not affect any arbitration procedure. And interim measures. As a rule, any arbitral tribunal has a general power to grant interim measures as per uh, Section 22B. It's a new section of Brazilian uh, uh, commercial co uh, uh, insolvency code. And even in Brazilian Arbitration Act, we have the same. Uh, neither the Brazilian Bankruptcy Act nor the Brazilian Arbitration Act expressly prevents the Arb arbitral tribunal from granting interim measures concerning a party subject to insolvency proceeding, either reorganization or widening up or liqu liquidation. However, interim measures that directly affect the insolvency insolvent assets, freezing orders, for example, uh, can only be granted by insolvency courts unless the insolvency court consider that that would not be his uh, competence. Um, after plan approval, and that's a quite new point to be discussed in Brazil. We don't have any cases there, but this is something that's been discussed a lot and we will probably have something soon. How does a reorganization procedure works in Brazil? The debtor files for the reorganization, so he has a time lapse to uh, present his reorganization plan, and then creditors will vote for that plan. If they vote favorable, favorable, favorably, uh, the plan will be approved if they vote against it, so there will be a liquidation winding up. Okay. But uh, according to Brazilian insolvency law, after a plan being approved, the debtor will continue in reorganization for at least two years more. This is what's called the supervision uh, period, supervision time. So during, during these two years, if any doubt arising from the plan appears, so the judge will decide this. The question is, is it possible to add an arbitration clause, an arbitration agreement to the plan? Could the plan, the plan itself, appoint that any question arising from the plan would be solved not by the judicial uh, court, not by the judge, but by one specific arbitration uh, tribunal appointed for that case? The second point is, uh, will this, such, such a measure, 
we don't have any so far, but we will have soon because we've been discussing plans that already has that, those clauses, but those plans have not been voted yet. The question is, will this, will this arbitration clause prevent the insolvency judge to decide the matters related to the uh, supervision uh, time? And more than that, as any uh, uh, collective decision, probably there, there will be people, there will be creditors that will vote for the plan, and there will be creditors that will vote against the plan, as well that as there will be creditors that will just not show up in the meeting or will just not vote. And the question is, will these people that have not voted for the plan, either because they voted against or because they voted, uh, they just didn't vote, will they be bind by this arbitration clause? Well, those are questions for which we don't have answers so far, but probably, probably we'll face those issues soon. And what those issues demonstrate? Those issues demonstrate that um, insolvency and arbitration are actual, definitely um, close institutions. Um, they help each other, but issues like this, or like confidentiality, for example, uh, based on the fact that transparency is a key issue in insolvency procedures, how would transparency uh, live together with confidentiality in arbitration? Is it possible to consider that arbitration in insolvency should necessarily be uh, uh, not confidential? Especially because, for example, when I give you the example in Brazil, other creditors, as mentioned before, and uh, public prosecutor could intervene in procedures, even in proof of claims. So even in questions that seems to be very close to a party-to-party -party interest relationship, uh, could uh, be of an interest of a third party. And another question. Uh, like in any arbitration, it's possible just to find a way, uh, a middle term, and get a settlement. Well, if there are just two parties disputing something, settlement would be great. But whenever you talk about insolvency, maybe the settlement will affect not just the parties that are uh, uh, part of the arbitration, but other creditors that may uh, uh, lose part of assets or amounts of money that otherwise would be shared to them. So how settlements should be uh, deal, deal, dealt with within uh, arbitration and insolvency? Those are questions that even if in Brazil we have a very nice amount of arbitrations related to insolvency cases. Those issues have never been um, addressed and they demonstrate that there is a lot to explore in this world of insolvency and arbitration. Thank you very much for your time.
Well, thank you very much uh, to both of you, Professor Bork and Professor Satiro, for these uh, very interesting um, uh, well, introductions and, and presentations on, on the topic at question. And uh, 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 if I may, I'd just uh, like to open the, the floor to everyone uh, to ask questions. Professor Tode. Well, um, thank you to both speakers. My question goes to Reinhardt, but it also relates to what you said on the OI uh, case, and it concerns the proving of uh, claims. Um, Reinhardt, you were referring to the binding effect a dispute between the liquidator and the creditor has on other creditors uh, concerning the uh, verification and the ranking of the claim. And then you said, uh, I hope I got it right, um, you said that it's not a question of arbitrability, but some other question, and I just want to make sure that I understood you correctly. Is, isn't it really a, well, isn't it a question of arbitrability? Well, I don't, I don't think so. I, I, I think um, the claim question is just a payment claim, and payment claims are arbitrable. Right. Uh, it's a question of extending an arbitration agreement to third parties who have not signed this arbitration agreement. And we have, we have similar constellations in company law. If, um, for example, a shareholder um, has litigation with the company and then we have a, a rule in statute which extends the effect of the court decision to all other shareholders, and the, uh, there, our um, federal Supreme Court um, has decided that this is not possible to bring to an arbitration tribunal unless all other shareholders have at least the chance to participate in these uh, arbitration proceedings. And I think that is a similar situation, and maybe it's just, the solution might be the same. But... Um, I, th I think that m needs more clarifi clarification by our federal Supreme Court because so far there is, uh, I guess I'm the only one who, who um, criticizes the arbitrability or the binding effect uh, or the possibility to bring c proof of claims to arbitration tribunal because of this extension of the effects to other third parties. I think that question ties very nicely into the last two questions you raised in your presentation, and that's the question of uh, transparency versus the non-public nature of arbitration proceedings on the one hand, and also on the question uh, of uh, negotiating a settlement or, or settling a dispute in the course of the dispute by the insolvency uh, practitioner. And I think the overarching question is what the role of the insolvency practitioner is, does he in a, in a way also, so is, is he some kind of trustee for the other creditors when, when, set, when taking such measures? Because if you, if, you, if you say everyone needs to be involved in every uh, dispute that may affect um, the financial outcome of the arbitration and every creditor has a say, that makes these things, uh, well, objectively not arbitrable and not disputable. And it's the same, and that's not, a, not only a question of arbitration, it's also a question, settlement also is a question that plays a role in state court proceedings. Exactly. When we're talking about um, insolvency procedures, uh, obviously we are talking about an insolvency debtor. So... Um, we shall take into account that probably there will be no assets for everybody, so we are sharing whatever there is. It's different from when we talk about solvent uh, debtors. So uh, if he decides to settle this or that way, that will not affect anyone in any other situation. But um, let me give, me you, give you an example. Let's imagine that uh, one of the providers, I don't know, um, suppliers, one of the suppliers of the debtors, the debtor, um, dispute that uh, he has delivered uh, 
a certain amount of whatever he supplies, and that that product was good enough to be to produce whatever the data produces. And the data says, no, it was not good enough. And the price for that is 1 million euros, let's say. Well, the point is, if they decide, okay, let's not fight anymore, I'll pay you 500,000 euros, and we will not discuss it, this anymore. That will be a nice solution for a sol solvent uh, agent. But certainly, if actually the product was not uh, able to uh, provide the result that he was supposed to, um, whenever the debtor say, says, well, okay, I'll pay you 500, he's actually uh, taking 500 off the rest of the creditors. So I don't think he could do that in, in, uh, in a collective um, uh, procedure like an insolvent procedure. So that's a very, very delicate issue, I think. Yes, I agree. I, I, I mean, not every financial effect of arbitration to other creditors justifies the thesis that uh, arbitration is impossible. For example, if you have transactions avoidance claims, whether the insolvency practitioner wins or loses affects the financial affairs of other creditors indirectly because if he wins there is more money to distribute among the creditors and if he loses this money is lacking. But that would not suffice in my view for saying this is not possible to be decided by an arbitral tribunal. Proof of claims is a different thing at least in Germany, because we have this, this rule that says that the, the result is binding on all other creditors, because that is a direct effect. It's not an indir indirect financial effect, it's a direct effect on the rights of other creditors, because they are prohibited to, um, to put the result of the arbitration uh, in, in question. And I, I think that's a different thing but it's also a, dis a different subject to discuss, I, I admit. Uh, yes. Please. Thank you. I, I do not want really uh, to yeah, misuse this uh, position of making, uh, putting questions. I just wanted maybe to um, uh, tackle a little bit a question of the arbitrability, in particular of the, of the uh, verification disputes. Uh, I understand that in Germany it is not a problem because there is no intervention on the jurisdiction of arbitrators when the, uh, 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 when the claim is disputed. However, in some jurisdictions, like for example in the United States, there is a very, very extensive jurisdiction of the courts, insolvent bankruptcy courts, so, so to speak, to decide about the, such disputes. And then that's why they have a kind of discretionary power, whether to do so and to deal with the case themselves or whether to refer to arbitration. And that is then the question of arbitrability because the vis attractiva of course uh, is obviously too strong uh, because the, the jurisdiction of the courts imposes, so to speak, on the jurisdiction of arbitrators. So it's different, I think, uh, within the different, uh, different uh, legal, uh, legal systems. So my question is um, whether we should, I would like to hear uh, Professor Bork's view, whether we should really treat the arbitrability differently from the issue of, uh, of conduct of, uh, of uh, insolvency proceedings, uh, also with respect to the uh, verification disputes. As a matter of principle, so not only under German law, but in general from the theoretical uh, uh, point of view. <laughs> yeah, that, that's always a problem. If, if we have uh, diverging solutions in, in various jurisdictions, one might say a certain solution is uh, preferable and I would uh, suggest that in all countries of, of the world uh, proof of claims is arbitrable, but this is wishful thinking, I, I, I guess. So in, in my view, it, it would be good to leave as much room as possible to arbitration because it, uh, it takes some burden from the shoulders of the, of the judges 
and uh, it makes, as, as we heard in, in our first talk this morning, it, it, it speeds things up. It, it makes the decisions quicker and um, and I think we can deal with, we can handle this problem of uh, interfering in third parties' rights. If you have 20,000 creditors and, and two or three are opposing the filing to the insolvency schedule, um, and they are entering arbitration and, and the award is binding on all the other 19,979 creditors, then it's nearly impossible to give them the chance to, to join the arbitration procedure. That might be easier in, in state uh, court proceedings. But that is a very extreme case, so I think normally we might be yeah, we might be able to handle this. Yes. Here. I've got a practical question about Brazil. Um, how is it in Brazil? Um, do third parties interact anyway? Because in Germany, actually, usually the creditors are not really interesting. As you already said, there are maybe two who are interested in the proceedings. Well, it, it's the same in Brazil. Not all creditors are interested in, but if, if the amount of the credit is it's relevant, probably that would bring attention to that. And, and I, I would say that small amounts of credits would not even be uh, part of arbitration. Arbitration is too expensive for small amount of credits, but for uh, relevant amount of credits, that would be interesting. Arbitration would be interesting in that case. I, I, I imagine that other creditors would have a, a, quite an interest in, in know, knowing what's going on in, and if everything is, is doing well, as they do in proof of claims in regularly, uh, regular, regular proof of claims before the judge as well. Thank you so much for the wonderful uh, presentations. Actually, my I have both que two questions to both uh, speakers. I will bring, I will give the later if possible. So my first question is uh, about the tension, actually, what uh, which you both mentioned between insolvency and arbitration. I would give my question in a form of hypothetical example. For instance, like uh, let's say if commercial parties have agreed to resolve their disputes, certain disputes, by arbitration. And by the later uh, change of circumstances, one of the parties becomes um, un unavailable to pay its debts. So then state court, because of the public policy matter, state court would intervene to, to preserve the public order, let's say. And then what will happen to the original arbitration agreement to, of the insolvent party. I would want to uh, hear probably Professor uh, Borgs and also if you want to add anything on that comment, please. Should I give my late second question or? I, I think I can answer this yeah, um, in one sentence because we have a special lecture on this topic uh, later on in, in this uh, event. Um, the arbitration clause is still valid and uh, even if one party is insolvent uh, the dispute has to be brought to an arbitral tribunal but maybe we can discuss uh, under German law maybe we can discuss that uh, later on if you have the lecture on the continuance of, of arbitration clauses in, in pre-insolvency contracts all right all right thank you should I, do we have time to give yeah, my there, there was, You had one question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, please. Thank you. So my second question is uh, related to Professor Satiro's uh, experience, I would say. So while I was researching on actually uh, 
court, choice of court agreements under Brazilian law. I looked at the Brazilian perspective. And um, so I know that uh, traditionally there was kind of rigidity to choice of court agreements rather than arbitration agreements in Brazil. But I want to know uh, what is, and then I read some articles about that uh, Superior Court of Justice of Brasilia um, has pro-arbitration uh, tension. So I want to know what is the perspective, as you mentioned also about competence, competence principle under Brazilian law. I want to know what would be the experience if there is any illegal uh, arbitration agreement and how the uh, Superior Court of Justice or the courts would approach to that from the perspective of competence, competence under Brazilian law. Um, well, um, considering insolvency issues, uh, actually um, there is not really a, a sort of choice of, of, of forum or something like that, because laws defi law defines where you should file your bankruptcy. Um, uh, but so I, I, I'm referring to the main procedure. And um, arbitration will probably be applied for related procedures, ancillary procedures. Um, whenever uh, the, the arbitration clause refers to something that Brazilian law considered to be a public policy issue, that would be considered to be illegal, and probably in that matter, uh, the uh, arbitration agreement would agreement would not be uh, executed probably um probably um, um i don't remember if the uh, our supreme court has said that one specific well there is one case there is one case there is a very famous case uh, where the supreme court decided that uh, the arbitration clause was illegal and with um, awful consequences, actually. It was uh, one clause, it was not an insolvency clause, but it was a clause that was in, in the bylaws of Petrobras. Petrobras is our petrol company, and, and it's a state company, state owned company, not just state, it, it has shareholders as well. But um, uh, in, the, in their bylaws, there is a, an arbitration clause. And uh, after being uh, started the arbitration with the, the arbitration panel ready, three arbitrators and etc., in the middle of the arbitration, um, after some appeals, the Supreme Court said, no, you are not allowed to bring a case against the state, the union, the government, and I consider that Petrobras is government, so you are not allowed to take uh, a, a case related to the government to arbitration unless the government uh, explicitly uh, accept it, no matter if it's in the bylaws of the company. And, and that was very uh, uh, polemic uh, 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 decision. Uh, lots of controversies about that, but, but the, that I remember this is the most, uh, I would say, aggressive um, case against arbitration. The question does to just disappeared from the screen, so <laughs> handle with care. Um, well, there is a, a question from um, Akshay Gantora, um, sorry, uh, Gant Gandotra, and the question is uh, when uh, you, Professor Borg, mentioned that um, arbitration may cover an issue subject to survival of the arbitration agreement, what would, uh, could be a possible scenario where though the issue is arbitral, but um, the arbitration agreement loses its validity. 
Yeah, well, that depends on the national insolvency law. There are arbit uh, the subject matter may be arbitral, but the insolvency law may simply interdict any arbitration and prohibit uh, to, to bring such cases to an arbitral tribunal. And that depends on, on insolvency. It's the same matter as, as we uh, mentioned in the context of your question. Um, does the insolvency practitioner have the right to terminate um, arbitration agreements? Or do the rules of executory contracts interfere? That's a matter of national insolvency law. But we will hear about that later on, I think. Yeah. Yes, uh, Mr. Penales. Yes, I, I think we can, we, we, one more question we'll, we can easily handle. So, Thank you. I'll have to select because there are many reactions uh, to, to, what, to your presentations. Maybe on the on the point of binding third parties and creditors, I wonder whether the the approach could be rephrased. That is, could we say that the award itself doesn't bind creditors? It is only when that award is introduced in the insolvency through a process of recognition or through a process of acceptance by the administrator before the, in, in the for the purpose of insolvency that then becomes binding. That before then. The award is not binding; it's just binding on the estate and and, and, and the party that was involved in the arbitration. Uh, then a question would arise: If creditors are not bound at that stage, can they bring actually a setting aside action against the award because they deem themselves damaged by by the outcome of the arbitration? But that would be um, a way of accepting that the arbitration doesn't bind creditors, but it's only when it's introduced in the insolvency that becomes. That has an expansive effect. Yeah, sure, that, that might be a very helpful solution, but unfortunately it's not the solution of German law. So the statute just says that creditors are bound by the decision, and it doesn't make any difference between state rulings and uh, arbitration rulings. So I'm afraid under German law this is a big problem. In other jurisdictions, your solution might be very helpful. Okay, well, yeah. I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think we are uh, spot on time wise. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your presentations and also um, uh, which were very stimulating as the discussion just showed. And uh, it was very interesting to see sort of the different jurisdictions and the different approaches. And when it gets really juicy is when this gets cross-border. So when you have the place of arbitration in one jurisdiction and the insolvent party comes from another jurisdiction. So please stay tuned, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll cover that later on in today's event. We have a short break until 12.15, and we'll resume in 15 minutes sharp. Thank you very much.
Are we all are we good to go? Okay, excellent. Well, then welcome back to everyone uh, here in the room and also online and uh, to the second part of the second session, so to say, uh, and uh, which will now deal with the scope of the arbitration agreement, ratio personae. Um, and I um, welcome Dr. Manuel Penades from King's College in London um, as our speaker for this topic. Uh, Manuel is a, an academic, an arbitrator, and a consultant in the field of international commercial law and dispute resolution. He is dual qualified and educated. He is a non-practicing solicitor in the UK and at the same time uh, an abogado in Spain. And he has both vast experience as counsel and arbitrator uh, under various sets of rules and also uh, has experience as a legal expert. He has appeared before various arbitral tribunals and the High Court of England and Wales. Um, and, uh, the, um, and he is one of the leading experts when it comes to the interplay between insolvency law and arbitration, so we are privileged to hear his uh, presentation on the scope of the arbitration clause and Manuel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Always too generous and too long. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will thank you for the invitation, but I might not thank you too much for putting me right after a very comprehensive and erudite session and before lunch, but I'll, I'll try my best. So I'm speaking about the subjective scope of the arbitration agreement. And phrased that way, the topic is actually not very often dealt with in the context of insolvency. Now, generally the discussion around insolvency and arbitration concerns whether the dispute is arbitrable, and we just had a session on that, whether the arbitration agreement remains valid and effective, whether it covers the subject matter in dispute, whether the participants retain capacity to arbitrate, whether procedural adaptations are necessary to take into account the insolvency event. But not very often do we ask who is bound by the arbitration agreement and whether the original parties must mutate as a consequence of insolvency. Now, it is a complex topic, as many of the topics that we are discussing today, and is very often intertwined with the previous topics that I just mentioned, which some of my colleagues have already addressed and will be addressed later today. So what this conundrum of topics means, or shows, is that framing the question, that is usually known as characterizing the issue, is one of the key challenges of the, and complexities of the interplay between insolvency and international arbitration. In this case of insolvency and arbitration, characterization is not just an innocent intellectual exercise of mere, um, with mere conceptual implications. To the contrary, given that each of the categories I just mentioned has a different applicable law regime, it has very severe practical implications. So characterization is not just one of the steps, but actually the step sometimes to identify the final answer as to what is the impact of insolvency on arbitration. That, of course, unless we adopt a transnational approach where issues of applicable law and therefore characterization uh, lose um, relevance. But that's, I guess, all of this, I guess it will be something that Professor Kroll might address later today, and I will not dwell into it anymore. I will address three points. First is who is bound by the arbitration agreement once an insolvency process commences, an administrator takes office, and creditors become directly interested in the patrimonial affairs of the insolvent estate. This, to me, is generally a question of jurisdiction. Second, who is the right person to participate in the arbitration? That is, assuming that in the vast majority of cases the agreement will bind the estate, the question is who is to participate on behalf of the estate? Whether the debtor, who was the original signatory to the arbitration agreement, or the administrator, 
who has been appointed to manage the state. And this is a question not of jurisdiction, but of procedure and procedural capacity, and is heavily influenced by the national insolvency law. And by participation, I do not refer simply to the mere right to be present and appear in the arbitration, but also to have an active role, making submissions, and even disposing of the litigious matter. That is, withdrawing a claim, reaching a settlement, as was mentioned before, or making substantive concessions during the arbitration. Who has the power to do all those procedural acts? This then will take us to the third and final topic I will address, which is the role of creditors, who are evidently concerned about the patrimonial affairs of the insolvent state, including arbitrations, but they are neither the debtor nor the administrator. Can they appear in the arbitration actively or as mere observants? Or at least, can they receive detailed information about the conduct and content of the arbitration? And how does the principle of confidentiality operate in that context? This is also a matter of procedure and is equally, in my opinion, heavily influenced by the applicable insolvency law. So those are the three questions. All these questions can arise in the context of arbitration proceedings which are pending at the time of the opening of insolvency proceedings or when arbitration commences exposed the insolvency petition. Perhaps there's an additional question, well, I should say two more questions because one of them was introduced by Professor Satira, who is, um, which is, are creditors bound by an arbitration clause concluded in the context of reorganization plan? And I already anticipated my answer, Re at least in the UK, reorganization plans do include sometimes arbitration agreements. And my view is that everyone is involved, is bound by, the, by that arbitration clause in the same way as a change or amendment or in the status of incorporation or a company bind all the shareholders even if they are not voting in favor of it. But that's my first reaction and I will need to look into that but that will be a, re a comment to your, to your topic. Now, I said that maybe there's an, a fourth question that I will not directly address today which is um, whether the debtor who survives the insolvency process through a re reorganization of its liabilities is bound by the arbitration agreements that the administrator may have concluded in the exercise of its office, and if so, what law governs whether that debtor is indeed bound by those arbitration agreements. I was involved a couple of years ago in an LCA arbitration when exactly that question was at the center of the debate. It was a post-insolvency arbitration case, and the question was whether the arbitration agreement concluded during insolvency was still binding on the rescued enterprise. And I could address that too, but perhaps I will hold back given that there's a session precisely on arbitration agreements concluded by administrators later on today. So this is the menu for my presentation, and although I do not want to make a lot of analogies with food just before, uh, before lunch. I will maybe make one last precision before you start on the substance. My presentation will focus on international commercial arbitration, but you should be aware that there's a host of different and very interesting questions around the subjective scope of the agreement to arbitrate in the context of insolvency and investment arbitration. There are many issues in that area, but essentially on the scope of arbitration agreements or commitments to arbitrate, as is the case in, in, in in investment, the question is who can bring the claim when the investor has been declared insolvent? Is it the administrator? Is it the company itself or its shareholders? This may have an impact on the requirement of the claimant's nationality to benefit from the BIT that gives rise to the investment claim, but becomes very, very problematic when the investor has been declared insolvent in the host estate by the host estate and the administrator has been appointed by the host estate and also the state is the defendant in the proceedings. Well, this, um, you may be interested to know that the IBA has just set up a working group to explore precisely these matters, investment arbitration and insolvency. And in the same way as I had the privilege to be the academic chair of the IBA toolkit on insolvency and arbitration, I've been appointed chair also of this second project. We are at the very start of the project, so if anyone is interested to participate or to be involved or has experience with this facet of the interplay, 
could you please feel free to contact me. I'll be very happy to put you in contact with the rest of the members of the working group. Now, I'm, I'm fully aware I have spent some time mapping out different questions and topics related to or around the topic of my presentation, but that was actually indeed one of the purposes I had today, because I believe that one of the challenges of insolvency and arbitration is precisely to identify and conceptually distinguish the very different issues that arise when the two disciplines um, um, cooperate or coexist. Now, let's start. The first point I mentioned was who is bound by the arbitration agreement. And here, as after reading 19 reports of the IBA toolkit and drafting the explanatory report, my view is that the general trend is that the agreement binds the estate, regardless of whether it is an administrator who takes control or a debtor who remains in possession. The party is the estate, the insolvent state. And the consequence is that the party directly concerned with the arbitration agreement is the insolvent estate. Any negative patrimonial impact following from an award will be suffered by the estate, and any patrimonial gain from the arbitration will also accrue on the insolvent estate. And whether the estate is personalized by a debtor or by the administrator will depend on who takes control after the opening of insolvency proceedings. That is, in general terms, there is no new party to the arbitration after insolvency. The issue is who represents the party. That may be subject to national laws and some, some um, approaches in, in different jurisdictions, but the overall view, at least in my opinion, is that. It may even be the case that a creditor is allowed to bring a claim on behalf of the estate and against a third party under a cause of action provided by law and for the benefit of the state. Assuming that the action in question is covered by the arbitration agreement, which might not be the case, and that's a different issue, my view is that that creditor will be bound by an arbitration agreement that the debtor and the third party concluded prior to insolvency. The creditor, in that case, is simply acting on behalf of the estate for the benefit of the estate. Now, there are four smallish points I want to address with regard to this, um, this issue of the position of the administrator vis-a-vis -vis the arbitration agreement. Now, one is that even if the administrator has been appointed, it may be that the debtor remains bound and in control of the arbitration agreement if that agreement concerns rights or assets not covered by the insolvency. So, for instance, that may be the case of personal rights, assuming that they are arbitrable. So, the logic is quite clear. If those assets or rights are not caught by the insolvency, the insolvency administrator has nothing to do with the agreements who re which regulate how those disputes are resolved. A second point is that the opening of insolvency might cause a change in the name of the party or might introduce a legal requirement to identify that that party is actually subject to insolvency proceedings. That must be reflected in the arbitration. So the identification of the parties to the arbitration and to the arbitration agreement needs to be also reflected in the arbitration. This ICC case looked precisely on the change of the name of the case after the opening of insolvency. A third point is that when an administrator enters into the arbitration, a new conflicts look will be required. Administrators sometimes come from big organizations, and there might be links between that organization and the arbitrators, links which did not exist before the insolvency. So they might pose some doubts as to the independence and impartiality of arbitrators now that the administrator is in office. So a new analysis of their independence and impartiality must be required. And the fourth point is that in some instances, the argument as to who is bound by the arbitration agreement has been mixed with matters of capacity to arbitrate. That is, if insolvency law provides that the debtor or the estate are prevented from taking part in arbitration, that is generally a matter concerning subjective arbitrability or capacity to arbitrate stricto sensu. It is not a question of whether the arbitrator takes over the gap left by the debtor. Usually, the policy behind those rules is simply to prohibit arbitration altogether during insolvency, because there's some level of reticence or mistrust or hostility towards arbitration. And it's actually quite interesting that in Spain, the Insolvency Law, the Insolvency Act, has created an action for the fraud precisely dedicated only to arbitration agreements and proceedings. So no arbitration 
awards. So the administrator can bring an action for fraud against the agreement itself. So there is an element of mm, doubt as to whether what happens in the arbitration might indeed be in the interest of insolvency. But those are cases of arbitrability, subjective arbitrability, whether that party can indeed participate in arbitration. Now, the impact that these rules may have on an international tribunal seated abroad, that's a different story, and for that we have Professor Kroll later today. But these prohibitions need to be distinguished from cases in which the debtor is deprived of its procedural capacity to participate in arbitral proceedings. Because in that case, this is not a rule of subjective arbitrability or capacity to arbitrate, but of procedural capacity. And therefore, it is not that the capacity to participate in arbitration has just evaporated uh, or extinguished. It simply is replaced by the arbitrator whose increase in procedural capacity usually reflects the decrease of procedural capacity of the insolvent party, sometimes complemented by the insolvency court. So this point, I believe, takes us to the second theme of my menu, which precisely concerns procedural questions as opposed to jurisdictional questions. Now, an expression that I'm sure all of us has heard before is that the administrator steps into the shoes of the debtor once insolvency proceedings has uh, commenced. The implication of this will be quite straightforward. The administrator takes the debtor's position in the arbitration just as the debtor steps out of the arbitration. And that might, be, might well be the case in, in many cases, in many proceedings, but it's not always that simple. In some instances, indeed, the insolvent debtor loses her capacity to govern the state and to, make, and to make acts of management or disposition over it. And in those cases, the administrator takes control and it is for her to make decisions concerning the commencement and continuation of the arbitration. The debtor just lost her say in the process. In other instances, the debtor does not lose her capacity to govern the state so her decision-making power remains, or at least coexists, with those of the administrator. And in those instances, the administrator may be required to participate in the arbitration, but not necessarily to exclude the debtor from the arbitration. And that coexistence of roles might be sometimes problematic. So the answer, in my view, as to procedural matters will depend on the insolvency law, as generally the procedural capacity of a party is governed by its personal law which for the purpose of simplicity, although that can get quite messy in itself, uh, we can equate the personal law with the law of the place where insolvency proceedings commenced. But that's, as I said, not always the case. That means that national law is indeed relevant. And let me give you some examples of national laws as to how they approach this issue. In England, an administrator or a liquidator appointed to a company takes control of the company at its business. They also have express powers under the Insolvency Law, and the Insolvency Act, to cause the company to bring or defend any arbitration that the liquidator or administrator made him relevant. In France, the situation is slightly different. The extent of the insolvency practitioner's powers will depend on the type of proceeding and the court decision opening those proceedings. For instance, in safeguard or receivership proceedings, the Insolvency Court defines the scope of the mission of the administrator. If the mission is of surveillance or assistance, the debtor remains in possession. When the mission on the other side is of representation, the administrator assumes all the management prerogatives and the ability to represent the state in, uh, in arbitration. If, this, if the proceedings are of concern liquidation, the liquidator, again, will take center stage. In the US, the well-known chapters 7 and 11 provide different solutions. If it's a chapter 7 case, liquidation, the trustee takes center stage and the debtor gets out, of the, gets out of the picture and does not participate in the arbitration because it is for the administrator, the trustee, to possess all the debtor's substantive rights in connection with the state, including the right to assert and defend claims in arbitration. And in chapter 11 cases, debtor in possession cases, the debtor will participate in the arbitration in its own name. I believe the regime is similar in, in Brazil and it's also similar in Spain, but I will not there discussing the Brazilian system or the German system in front of this well-learned audience. But one point that arises in some jurisdictions is when the administrator takes full control 
but the debtor still wants to participate in the arbitration, or even is allowed to participate in the arbitration. In, but in that case, the debtor is participating in his own right, is not participating as representative of the estate. And therefore, his role or her role will be first subject to the authorization by the parties or the arbitral tribunal as well, sometimes the insolvency court, depending on the national system. But most importantly, the debtor will not be directly at the receiving end of the award, which will bind the estate. Its participation will be somehow instrumental and especially the tribunal might find that having the debtor present might be beneficial for the proceedings. Now, so far I've been making reference to participation in proceedings, but parties do much more than just participate, than appear. One of the issues that arises in practice is who is empowered to take dispositive decisions about the object of the arbitration. That is, settling the dispute, withdrawing a case altogether, making concessions in the course of the proceedings, and again, national law, in my view, is relevant for these questions. And in that point, legal systems have very divergent approaches. In England, the liquidator or the administrator have the power to settle any claims brought by or against the company without the need of any confirmatory order from the court. They can do it themselves. However, creditors of the company may challenge the office holder's decision to agree to such a settlement by filing an application to court. And for that reason, in some instances, the administrator or the liquidator consults with those creditors or even seeks court approval, but as a matter of discretion, as opposed to a matter of obligation, before a significant settlement has been reached, precisely to avoid problems with the complexity of um, or the validity of that settlement afterwards. More or less along the lines of what you discussed before, that it's sometimes advisable to consult the College of Creditors before a settlement is, is reached. But it's not a mandate of the law to do so in England. In France, in contrast, no settlement may be entered into, and no settlement may bind the estate before being authorized by the insolvency judge. And the position is actually similar in the US, according to the sources I have consulted, where the bankruptcy court must approve a settlement, both in Chapter 7, but also in Chapter 11, debtor in possession. Again, the positions of Brazil and Germany, I'll leave it for the experts in the room, although you should be aware that the IBA toolkit on insolvency and arbitration precisely deals with this question in question 18 out of the 36 that you can find in the IBA toolkit. Now, the third and last point I wanted to address, and has been mentioned already today, is the issue of confidentiality, which is, as we know, frequently invoked as one of the defining features of arbitration. So how does it coexist with the legitimate interest of creditors to monitor the patrimonial affairs of the insolvent estate? And here, I'm afraid rules are very much inexistent, and solutions need to be adopted by the insolvency court and the arbitrators on an ad hoc basis. Still, one mm, rule of thumb will be that confidentiality is not absolute and might need to concede before some circumstances of collective interest. But on the other side, the collective interest does not necessarily mean that creditors can simply appear in the arbitration, observe the proceedings, and gather all the relevant information. A balance is necessary and the administrator will play a fundamental role in finding that balance, because she personifies the collective interest. Her presence should, in principle, satisfy the need to cater for the insolvency concerns in the arbitration. So, so through the reporting duties that the administrator has, creditors may access information about the estate and outcome of arbitration in as much it has patrimonial relevance, which is what insolvency should be about. But additional access into the arbitration for the sake of it by a creditor should not be allowed. And I should here um, mention that I believe there is, in Brazil actually, a couple of the three decisions of 2019 where the insolvency court lifted, issued an order lifting the confidentiality of the arbitration in order to facilitate access to creditors to the full information file of the arbitration because it found to be in the interest of the patrimonial um, 
interest of the creditors. It is indeed a, a, a controversial decision from the point of arbitration, but it was adopted, I believe, in 2019 by, some, by the, the courts of Sao Paulo. Now, this issue of confidentiality, however, might sometimes sound more complicated than what it is actually in practice. Why? Because frequently the creditor will have to file the claim with insolvency to join the body of creditors. And sometimes this is even a requisite to be able to continue with the arbitration, and that happens in France, without a doubt, it's part of international public policy and in other legal systems. Well, such filing will contain information about the underlying contract uh, and about the credit in dispute and the fact that this subject on arbitration clause. That information will be available to any other participant in the context of the insolvency process. If contested, the claim will become contentious. That is, if the administrator does not accept the claim, it will, it will become a contentious matter and probably return to arbitration to be resolved, although that will depend, again, on the legal system, given that some legal systems will find that in the verification claim, that's part of the exclusive jurisdiction of the insolvency court. And so far, until that stage, the procedure will have been public, and the vast majority of creditors will be able to access all that information. It is only at that stage, when the claim is sent back to arbitration to be resolved, that other information will cease to be available to creditors, but however, will continue to be available to the insolvency administrator, who will report with some brief information to the body of creditors at a later stage. And I believe this is a good compromise between maintaining confidentiality but allowing creditors to know about the existence and the status of the arbitration, but not the details of its content. Now, by way of conclusion, although I might have a couple of points later, is that insolvency generally does not modify the parties to the arbitration agreement. The estate remains bound. What might change, however, and sometimes very significantly, is who represents the estate. That will be the debtor, or that will be the administrator, depending on the case and the applicable law. What this shows, however, is that insolvency is not necessarily an impediment for arbitration. But equally, arbitration should not turn its back to the insolvency event and pretend it's business as usual, because it's not. Arbitration is private paid justice in the context of absence of money. And, and, and a balance needs to be found. A procedural adaptation might be required, even if arbitration, if insolvency does not pose an existential threat to arbitration. So that's all I wanted to say for now. I'm happy to answer any question that you may have. And thank you very much for your attention. Well, Manuel, thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> this was another very good overview and um, excellent presentation on, uh, of the topic on um, the subjective arbitrability. Uh, I, and um, um, I would like to give the floor to uh, uh, the opportunity to ask questions or everyone who is in the room. And if you have any online questions, please feel free to ask them. Stefan? Thank you very much, Manuel, for that excellent presentation. Um, I was particularly intrigued by your explanation of the third-party creditor claiming under the arbitration agreement. Are you aware of any of those cases? And what happens if a third-party creditor wants to join though the original debtor um, is still in, or the insolvency administrator is still in. How would you deal with these cases? Thank you, Stefan. Always a difficult question. Um, so it is, I am not aware of any 
real case where this has happened. However, what I'm aware is that under some insolvency laws, creditors are entitled to either request the administrator to commence a claim based on the contracts concluded by that debtor before the insolvency or based on any statutory legal basis to commence mm, claims against a third party. And under some legal systems, if the administrator refuses to do so, it might be possible for the creditor to take initiative. Now, what I'm then questioning is if the creditor is intending to commence those claims, is he or she bound by the arbitration agreement? If there is an arbitration agreement, the transaction that they are using as the legal basis for the claim. Um, given that in those instances the creditor is not acting in its own interest, but on behalf of the estate for the benefit of creditors, my view will be that the creditor is indeed bound by the existing arbitration agreement. Subject to two matters. First, whether the claim is covered by the arbitration agreement, given that in some instances an issue may arise as to the fact that that claim didn't even exist before the arbitration agreement was concluded, because that's probably um, a claim based on a right conferred by the, the insolvency law, maybe. Yeah, and if that's the case, it may be excluded, as the Singapore case um, Larson um, mentioned uh, earlier today. Then it may also be the case that the matter is even not arbitrable at all because it's based on a core insolvency right, although I will have my questions on that. Um, so that, is, that was the level of speculation I was entering into to make that point, but not based on any practical experience. Are there any further questions or observations? Yes, please. Thank you uh, very much, Manuel, for your presentation. And um, I'm not so sure whether it's a question that uh, falls under the realm of your topic or it's something that Vesna uh, intends to address later on. But, you know, there have been um, quite a few suggestions and uh, about the importance and the practical uh, significance of arbitration, particularly in a corporate insolvency, corporate group insolvency context. And the suggestion that, uh, I mean, we know all the infamous uh, recent cases in recent years of endless litigation on uh, corporate group insolvency, beginning Lehman Brothers, Nortel, and, and all this. The question is, um, Putting aside the more merely theoretical usefulness of that, the idea of having the, uh, I, the uh, insolvency practitioners of every single uh, entity in a corporate group agreeing on a common uh, distribution plan and agreeing to arbitrate that, to what extent that is within the power of the IP from the perspective of each of the individual insolvency proceedings, that is, um, can, you, can, can we affirm that what is best for the group resolution is also what is best for each insolvency? And can we say that the IP has the right to agree to that, even if it might come at a con potential conflict with the creditors in one of the individual uh, proceedings? And I, as I said, I don't know whether you intended to address it or Vesna intended to address that, but any, I think I would appreciate your views anyway. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I'm very happy that you make that question because it helps separate two very different topics which have on the same sentence in solving and arbitration but are conceptually very different. One is the impact that insolvency of a party has on the arbitration commitments of that party. And that so far has been the topic for today. Usually those issues arise based on arbitration agreements concluded prior to the insolvency or by the administrator concerning one specific transaction. Now, your question is completely different, even though also concerns arbitration and insolvency, is can we use arbitration to address insolvency specific scenarios, primarily in the cross-border context or group insolvency context? That is a topic which has not been developed much. There are around seven or eight articles on it. 
And it's a topic that we are starting to develop, as I mentioned before, with the Charter Institute of Arbitrators, as well as the Judicial Insolvency Network. Now, those are arbitration agreements which will have to be concluded by administrators or sometimes approved by courts if the IP, as you said, doesn't have the prerogative to enter into those. They will usually be concluded in the context of protocols, protocols of collaboration between insolvency courts, where there will be either a binding arbitration agreement or an offer to arbitrate, similar to what you find in investment arbitration cases, where any creditor who wants to file a claim and doesn't know whether to do it in one insolvency process, in another insolvency process because there are many territorial ones or different subsidiaries involved, they might simply resort to this arbitration panel. That arbitration panel will have been given the power by all the administrators or the insolvency courts, depending on who has the power to actually delegate that power. So that decision, using the New York Convention, but also given the authority of the protocol itself, will be accepted in all the insolvency proceedings. And that, that arbitral tribunal will have two functions. One is to adjudicate the issue in, in, in question, but sometimes it might also be about where the asset belongs, because a, a claim or an asset might be claimed between different members of, a, of, of the corporate group, or might not be clearly whether it belongs in one territorial proceeding or another territorial proceeding within the same um, legal um, entity. If, if we manage, but here the, the, the hurdle is actually creating that, ins, that arbitration mechanism. And uh, as you point out, it is not clear that every IP will have those powers. Because while we are talking about contractual disputes in some instances, in, in so other instances we are talking about allocating, allocation of assets, to defining the estate. And defining the estate is not a private matter. It's, an, it's a prerogative of the insolvency court. And it is only through express the delegation that that can take place. And in some instances, not even the insolvency court will be able to do it because they are not allowed by law to do it. So it will be necessary for those protocols to actually fly and be successful to um, change insolvency laws in some systems. And certainly UNCITRAL is very well placed to promote the framework within which those, those, those changes uh, can, can, um, can take place. So one thing is the legitimacy and ability to create, and then how do we articulate the mechanism itself? And that's something that also could be regulated by, by UNCITRAL, and we are trying to do through our, our model protocols. Manuel, just a very brief follow-up question. So that's a sort of um, an idea to come. It's not, it, it, uh, such protocols have not been concluded yet. Thank you. There is some brief experience in the Nortel case, in the Lehman Brothers case, and in around six or seven protocols which introduced arbitration. Uh, arbitration offers or commitments between the different courts to be bound by the decision of the arbitrator. They had very limited success, either because of um, lack of knowledge of the arbitration system or because sometimes the um, the national courts did, refused to give that power which they thought belonged to them to an external, sort of la less than transparent body. Whereas if that body was protocolized, was given sort of legitimacy by a UNCITRAL framework or another framework, would actually take, uh, would be much more um, or higher chances of, of, of success. So it, it has existed, but as I mentioned before, primarily in common law jurisdictions where the courts have found that it is within their prerogative. I know that all the jurisdictions are not willing to do that unless the law is changed or unless, unless some case law develops, which clearly manif manifests the benefits of it. Uh, well, I think um, without, having look <coughs> without having looked into it, but the German perspective probably would be in order for a court to transfer parts of its power to an arbitral tribunal, uh, it would need a statutory basis to do so. Um, and so it might well be that Germany's approach is to say, without a legal basis, that will be difficult, but I, I stand to be corrected. Um, are there, uh, well, I, there's no strong opposition at least. Um, are, are there any further questions or observations Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much again for the presentation.
Uh, you, you, I'm, I apologize if I, if I was a bit slow there, but you mentioned that uh, we would have to distinguish subjective arbitrability from procedural capacity. Could you explain that again? Because I was a bit confused recently by some Swiss case law that uh, seemed to use those uh, concepts synonymously. Uh, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. I, I wonder whether you refer to CVD. It's not that recent. It's 2014 after Vivendi and, and, and Electrim, uh, which is well known in the field of arbitration and insolvency with the English branch and the Swiss branch. Um, so what happened in that case, and I know the case a little bit from inside as well, um, is that Polish law, uh, Article 147, I believe, of the Polish bankruptcy so, law said that you could... Um, arbitration agreements cease to be effective after the opening of insolvency. And the question was, how do we characterize that provision, that this is police law in a contract that provides for arbitration in Switzerland and also another one in the UK? The, and the ability of the lawyers, and it is the ability of the lawyers, was to bring that Polish provision, which had nothing to do with the arbitration, into the arbitration to kill the arbitration. Well, that was the strategy. Now, how do we bring it? We have to bring it by dressing that provision, that issue, as something that is governed by Polish law. Now, what does Polish law govern in an arbitration city in Switzerland? Capacity. The capacity of the Polish party. So the only way to bring the Polish provision was to characterize it as a matter of capacity. And that was successful by, before the arbitral tribunal, and it was successful before the Swiss federal court. That was that's the 2006 judgment, or nine judgment, of the, of the insolvency. Now what happened in, in that case is that they used subjective arbitrability and also capacity to arbitrate interchangeably. Well, 2004, in, that, it, actually, in, interestingly, that was a decision of three judges against two, and it was not published in the official Gazette in Switzerland, because even though it confirmed an award, and some could say it's arbitration friendly, the federal court has confirmed what an arbitral tribunal has done, it has confirmed that arbitration cannot proceed, because that's exactly, so it might be arbitration hostile on the other side. Now, in 2014, there was another case involving a Portuguese uh, a Portuguese party and a Chinese party. And the Portuguese law, Article 87, arbitration uh, agreements cease to have effect. And that's exactly the same provision that Spain had before uh, a change. What the court, the, the, the um, Swiss federal court, was to change the characterization. It said that the arbitrability, even subjective arbitrability of a party, only disappears when that party ceases to exist. That it has to be a radical rule of the court of, of the country of origin, in that case Portuguese or Polish in this electric case, which says that that company has ceased to exist, is liquidated, is wound up. Whereas if we are dealing with simply a provision that prevents arbitration, which was indeed the effect of Article 87 of the Portuguese Insolvency Act, that's something that will not have relevance, because that's something that will concern a subjective arbitrability. And subjective arbitrability, they said, will be governed in this case by, um, by, by, by um, Swiss law. So what they did was simply changing the approach to how they characterize the identical provision in, in Portugal that came similar to, 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 Portugal, to, to, yeah, to the, Pol the Polish provision, I apologize. I don't know whether I answered your question, and if not, I apologize. <laughs> and it's maybe something which can be very well continued over lunch. Um, so, being aware of time, uh, thank you very much again, Manuel. That was a very uh, instructive, very helpful. And uh, we close this morning's program and uh, reconvene at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, um, if I'm correct. Yes, so see you all back at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Oh, hello, everybody. Let's go on with our event. And I'm very pleased to uh, announce now and call you for her speech, mm -hmm. Professor Vesna Lazic. Is it correct? Yeah. It's she is an associate professor at Utrecht University and a senior research researcher at TMC.
Fawcett Institute in Hague. <coughs> Private international law, international dispute settlement, especially international commercial arbitration are the fields of her particular interest and expertise. She teaches, publishes and coordinates various research projects in the field of EU private international law. Against her, uh, among their publication are the book The Lazit, Insolvency Proceedings and Commercial Arbitration, uh, the Hague Law uh, Boston, and Recasting the Insolvency Regulation, Improvements and Missed Opportunities, Short Studies and Appeal. I'm pleased to ask Professor Fesna to take the time, please. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank organizers uh, for taking an effort and uh, creating this opportunity for us to exchange other thoughts on the wide range of topics in this very, very interesting but complicated area, area of law. And to thank Mr. Banto for inviting me here to, um, to speak um, on an interesting topic. Um, let me just say that I almost, almost considered to remove presentations on executory contracts and avoidance powers of the trustee from any presentation on insolvency and arbitration because I thought it was the least controversial issue in arbitration. Well, based on the comparative research that I con conducted many years ago and I didn't see any significant changes in the field since then. The moment of changing the plan <laughs> to, uh, and still to keep it within the presentation of insolvency and arbitration were uh, two cases. The English case is already mentioned here uh, by Professor Bork, uh, brought by the English courts uh, uh, relating to the avoidance powers of the trustee. And that was just before uh, one of the seminars we had um, uh, on the discussion in which uh, also Stefan took place in, I think, December 20. 2020. Uh, so in that case, I decided to put it back on the presentations and the another controversial decision is the one that I would like to uh, discuss with you today at the end of my presentation. And that deals with executory uh, contracts and arbitration clauses and their fate when they are contained in such an executory prepetition uh, um, insolvency um, uh, proceedings uh, contract. Uh, my uh, presentation is structures, uh, structured in the following way. Uh, first, I would like just to give some um, brief outline of the context, uh, in particular from the uh, arbitration uh, point of view, uh, in which uh, il to illustrate that really when one party is a, a party to insolvency proceedings, it is not, as Manuel, sa Manuel said, is not uh, as business as usual. Um, there must be certain concerns that arbitrators have to take into consideration and reasons for that. Uh, secondly, after that, I would just um, outline some general trends in comparative law concerning the executory contracts and the fate of arbitration clauses contained in the underlying transactions. And finally, I would uh, devote some couple of words to these controversial decisions taken by the Canadian courts, or rather courts of the British Columbia, and with respect to which we expect the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada uh, with sincere hope that it will be overturned. Uh, let me just start with the, with the first uh, topic that I announced. So these are basically, I would say, the most important aspects from the arbitrator's point of view. Why should we take into consideration the fact that one of the parties is a subject to insolvency proceedings? So again, one of the important part of the arbitration law is, of course, due process requirement. Considering that trustee or insolvency practitioner is by no means free in conducting and pursuing actions there, it's not in, in, according to his own preferences, but he's strictly bound by the law on insolvency in making such steps. Secondly, uh, considering the, uh, the, the jurisdiction part of the courts in bankruptcy proceedings or insolvency proceedings, they may somehow try to extend their jurisdiction, which may coincide with the jurisdiction of arbitrators. So in order to validly establish the jurisdiction, so arbitrators should also then consider the aspects, in particular the aspects of non-arbitrability, which is the one, but not the only, um, aspect that can affect the jurisdiction. And of course, in most general terms, the third 
uh, would accompany the first two as well, enforceable award. It is at least the effort that arbitrators should strive to have an enforceable uh, arbitral award. <clears throat> this is an outline of some, maybe I made some general division about the actions that the trustee or uh, insolvency practitioner pursues uh, after the opening of the insolvency proceedings. I tried to make some two large groups of it. One would be the causes of action that he exercises on behalf of the debtor because the debtor is in no, no longer in the position to manage and to uh, dispose of the estate and also not be the parties in legal proceedings. So these are the so-called uh, causes of action inherited from the debtor. And second part are the causes of action that are basically given to the insolvency practitioner by the insolvency law. This is not something that would belong to the debtor, but only to the insolvency practitioner. And these are the most important uh, uh, here that we are going to discuss within this session. Uh, the one is, which I'm going to address, these are the fate of the uh, executory contracts. And the second is avoidance transactions that were already addressed today uh, by Professor Bork. Um, <clears throat> so I would concentrate, as I mentioned, on the first one, and it is the executory contracts. And here as well, I would just like to mention that, um, so what is the, the executory contract? The contract, of course, they may have, they, they are not universally regulated in every insolvency law. But what we have, that there are some common denominators. And these are the contracts which are not fully performed by either of the parties. So such contracts, the trustee is normally, usually under insolvency law, in the position either to accept or resume or to reject uh, um, uh, such contracts. And then the questions in that, in that uh, sense is, there are twofold question. The first is, what happens to arbitration clause contained in a such uh, underlying transaction if the contract is refused or if it is uh, accepted? And in the case of refusal, uh, we also have a question which can be posed, and I think it's been, been touched upon today on a couple of occasions, is whether an arbitration clause itself may be an executory contract, which can be also repudiated by the, uh, by the insolvency practitioner. Because typical arbitration clause in situation where no arbitral proceedings are pending yet, it is a kind of executory contract. So the first question is, is that can we really qualify an arbitration clause as an executory contract within the meaning of insolvency law? So what I would say as a matter of principle, I think it would be very difficult, considering that when a contract, a underlying contract is repudiated, it is not the end of the story. The other party has a right, of course, to claim damages for the, such a kind of breach of the contract. And such a party becomes a party in insolvency proceedings, an ordinary, non-preferred, uh, non-secured creditor which has to file this claim within insolvency proceedings for verification. It is very, very difficult to imagine what kind of damages would be, um, could be made uh, and um, how we could assess the damage of repudiating arbitration clause. So in that sense, that would not be, uh, uh, I think, would not be possible. Uh, this issue was already discussed by Professor J. Westbrook already in early 80s, and that was early conclusion also reached uh, basically also in the U United States um, case law, although indirectly. Sometimes though, however, in the literature, a different approach has been suggested, often not really supplemented by any cases, but suggested that it could be the anal analog uh, analogic uh, application of the provisions on disclaimer, and also in favor of that, another argument would be that the trustee or insolvency practitioner would be then in a position to kind of have a larger control over the um, effectiveness of arbitration clauses. But again, it's a really scarce, at least um, no case law that I know of uh, in such uh, situations. So basically, I think as a matter of principle and depending also on, on, on a legal system, a particular legal system, I would think that as a matter of principle, that would not be possible. What is rather possible and what, it, what does happen on the regular basis, I would say, is 
that there are rejection of the underlying transaction in which uh, there is an arbitration contained. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> uh, like we can say also, we can see some general trends. Uh, if there is a rejection of the contract, it does not really result as a matter of principle and in itself as invalidating uh, arbitration clauses. The question whether or not this clause will be really given effect, it depends. It depends on the particular legal system. And also, I would say it depends. What we see in this slide is basically an outline of how it would go. So one is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it results in the other party being entitled to damage. The other party also may request an early decision of the insolvency practitioner in that sense. And if the trustee wishes to continue, then it must, must be given also security for that. If it doesn't accept the contract, then it becomes an ordinary, as I said, ordinary claim. Basically, everything what can be said about the arbitrability of verification disputes applies in an equal measure here as well, because these are becoming the claims of ordinary bankruptcy creditors. So answer on that question, whether or not would that be really referred to arbitration or not, would depend on the national law and the situation in that national law. In some jurisdiction, in particular, as I already mentioned today, United States still have some discretion, even despite the mandatory nature of a mandatory referral to arbitration, some well, margin of discretion in doing so. Uh, what is, so this is just, uh, I think, <clears throat> uh, the second question I, I thought always an easy one is what happens if the insolvency practitioner accepts the contract? And I think that was really the least controversial because I think almost unanimously we would say if the, the trustee accepts the underlying uh, transaction, it accepts all clauses of that contract, including the arbitration clause as well. This is uh, just a few of the cases that I took as an example or prevailing views in the literature. So the case law in, in the United States points to that direction as well. The France, the same. Germany, Austria, and Netherlands, from the toolkit information, they uh, provide with the same result. In England, we have also interesting development that it is uh, even provided in the law, uh, express provision only with respect to the individual bankruptcy of a physical person, but not with respect to liquidation of, of, of the company. Uh, it has been now to, taken over even after the new Arbitration Act. So it's quite unanimous. And I would say I have never found any controversial points until this case. <laughs> and that is a, uh, this is a rather recent case decided by the uh, two courts in uh, British Columbia. The first instance court, um, so we have uh, an underlying transaction partnership agreement. One of the parties of Petrovest was put in insolvency proceedings, um, um, receiver was appointed, there was um, a receiver wanted to assume certain contracts and then pursue the actions uh, arising from these partnership agreements and also uh, several other purchase orders and other agreements uh, containing arbitration clauses. Other parties opposed, so it started court proceedings, and the other parties, of course, uh, contracting parties, um, objected the jurisdiction of the courts, invoking here arbitration clause in the resumed or assumed uh, contract. And they relied, of course, on this provision, which is a provision on a mandatory referral to arbitration. This is a provision of Canadian law, corresponding fully, basically, to Article 2 of the New York Convention, uh, in which, so it is the, the provision as it is, uh, the court has no discretion in referring the parties uh, to arbitration unless uh, arbitration clause itself is void, null, inoperable, or incapable of being performed. So that's the same provision. The first instance judgment, the judge refused. Based it on using its dis um, discretionary power, uh, not to refer the parties to arbitration. And you see the articles are, I would say, pretty much convincing. Um, costs and time involved would affect the financially the, the means of the debtor. And, of course, the, the, the whole uh, uh, a group of creditors, uh, they would delay multilateral uh, uh, proceedings in arbitration, so that would be 
not be beneficial. It would, would be detrimental to the estate and to the creditors. Appellate court, however, was in favour of not referring the parties to arbitration, so in that sense it did confirm this decision, but this basically overturned the decision on the, those reasons for not referring to arbitration. So the court found another line of argument, argumentation here, stating that the, the trustee in this connection and in this particular situation was not a party to the uh, arbitration clause. That these were the causes of action exercised on the basis of the insolvency law, and as such, the arbitration clause cannot be binding on, upon the trustee, because the tr trustee does not act as an agent of the debtor. And I would say this is the most um, obvious error in the line of reasoning, because the only thing which is granted by a statutory insolvency law is the possibility to reject the, those contracts. As soon as they are accepted, then there is no difference in the causes of action that the debtor outside of the bankruptcy also could have exercised. So the only thing, as I said, and the possibilities to ask for the, uh, for the securities. And most importantly, and most shockingly, in this decision is this. The court invoked on its own motion the principle of severability, or separability of arbitration clause, which I guess to every arbitration lawyer may be really come as a surprise, using and relying on the separability not to uphold the validity, but to deny the validity of an arbitration clause. Rather unique exercise, I would say. And most importantly, not, none of the parties even not, not, didn't ask and refer to the principle of severability, but opposed it. One of the parties stated it was irrelevant. The other party said, you can't use the <laughs> separability in this context. However, the court simply concluded that this is on the basis of a separability that is separate contract and can be denied effect even if the underlying contract was accepted by the trustee. So just for the purposes of <coughs> conclusions, um, I think that such decisions which really deviate, including the two decisions mentioned today on the avoidance powers, they are really hardly and very confusing for the both arbitration community and the insolvency uh, uh, practitioners and insolvency lawyers community, because they really depart from some generally accepted, uh, accepted uh, approaches in this very, very, very complex field of law. Therefore, I would again uh, draw your attention back again to the IBA uh, toolkit, because in any case, this is a very easily accessible source of an information, just in order to see what are really the main trends. Of it, or can we say that there are some main trends? And if there are the decisions that are really obviously depart from such uh, common, I would say, uh, uh, common instances and, and common directions, then there would be certainly um, alert for those uh, practitioners, both in arbitration and insolvency, as I said. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Professor Vesna. It was really, really interesting. And uh, I'm pleased to call now Barbara Gadig. Barbara Gadig is a PhD candidate, both at Sao Paulo University, USP, and Lisbon University Law School. She obtained her LLM from Lisbon University, including an exchange in international comparative business law at Bucerius Law School, this school. In her, in her doctoral project, she is examining transactions avoidance in insolvency. She is a visiting researcher at Max Planck Institute for International Comparative Private Law in Hamburg, and she was a Brazilian delegate for UNCITRAL Working Group 5 Insolvency Law in the 59th section. Uh, Ms. Gadig, please, floor is, floor is yours. <laughs> 
Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you, having the chance to talk about avoidance claims and arbitration, which has, has been addressed before by Professor Heinrich Bork. And it is indeed a complicated issue, as Professor, Verna, Professor Vesna just said. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Stefan Kohl for organizing together with Professor Heinhard Borg and Professor Francisco Sachiro this conference. It's an honor to be here, always the best professors and practitioners in insolvency law in Europe and Latin America. My greetings to Professor Vesna Lazic and Professor Maria de Lourdes Pereira, which will share this panel with me. So, First of all, I need to understand how to deal with the PowerPoint. <laughs> Thank you. The f this one? Okay. Thank you. So, this is just a funny thing <laughs> to show a bit about what we are dealing with. Two dogs fighting. It could be a bone, but it's not. But in fact, two different and quite opposite fields in law, insolvency and arbitration. In the middle, not so much money, lots of creditors, and lots of issues to be addressed. I will try to divide my panel in the issues, differences, the role of avoidance rules in insolvency. Uh, my point will be, my reference will be Brazilian law. And just a few conclusions. So my presentation today will address some issues regarding avoidance claims and a pre-existing arbitration agreement to which a debtor is part in, relo in relation to those claims. As I said, my reference point will be Brazilian law. My goal is explore whether avoidance claims can be arbitrable under Brazilian insolvency law. First, let me start with a few differences between arbitration and insolvency. By referring the role of avoidance provisions in insolvency law and their relation to arbitration. So, as you are aware, as it has been said before, in arbitration, parties are free to establish rules of procedure to select the, the arbitrator. The whole process is not disclosed. An arbitral award is equivalent to a judgment of a court in terms of its certainty and enforceability. However, when comparing the fundamental principles underlying insolvency and arbitration, they are based on different and opposite point. Insolvency procedure mainly has a formalistic approach to dispute resolution supervised by a court, aiming fundamentally the payment of creditors. Within this general context, insolvency law starts from two principles, maximization of the pool of assets and equal treatment of creditors. <coughs> Arbitration, by contrast, owes its existence to a decentralized and autonomy-based approach to dispute resolution. Uh, furthermore, the procedure in insolvency has the public uh, policy rationality behind. Additionally, it's also important to emphasize that insolvency law does not have generally the characteristic of adversarial proceeding, but rather to incentivize parts to cooperate for the same role. Arbitration, as I said, has a decentralized, contractual, and autonomy-based approach to dispute resolution. Two questions of the interaction between arbitration and insolvency often fall from the, from the nature and distinct purpose in both proceedings. As a result, sometimes it's not possible to align them. Turning now our attention to avoidance rules, they are an important part of substantive insolvency law. 
and they are based on several principles, but the main ones being optimal payment of creditors' claims by the maximization of assets value and equal treatment of creditors. These rules are mainly designed to invalidate detrimental transactions that are disadvantages to the body of creditors. It is related to one of the goals of insolvency, which is the maximization of the pool of assets for the purpose of best realization of the debtor, debtor's assets. They enable to increase the insolvency state as available at the point in time when the proceeding was opened by swelling the assets and also aim equal treatment, which means that creditors should be paid equally according to their rank of priority in bankruptcy law. I would say the whole insolvency system pursues this as a concept of justice. Most jurisdictions differentiate on the exact scope of avoidance rules, such, prefer, such like preferences transactions at undervalue fraudulent transactions, for, exa for example. Basically, these rules are, are designed to seek the preservation of assets for the collective procedure. Nonetheless, the arbitrability of avoidance transactions must be weighed and balanced accordingly. As such, avoidance rules play an important and formative role in this context, which is the possibility of protecting creditors from detrimental acts made prior to the beginning of insolvency proceeding. This is a, it's a part of public policy and creditors' interests. Which, in this context, I shall explore which effect an arbitration clause has that can be found in the contract which turns out to be voidable and, consequently, its limits after the commencement of insolvency proceeding. As Professor Statiro has mentioned before, Brazilian Insolvency Act provides on Article 6, Paragraph 9, the, that the commencement of a judicial reorganization proceeding or the issuance of a winding up order will neither permit the trustee to discharge the arbitration agreement nor prevent arbitrations from starting or continuing. This paragraph was included by the amendment of the law, which came into force in December 2020. Let me start saying that this is a quite far reaching uh, statute in comparison to other jurisdictions which only protect pending arbitrations or does not, protection, do, does not protect arbitration proceedings at all. Brazilian insolvency law has two main provisions concerning transaction avoidance, which are section 129, similar to German insolvency law, in, in terms of number only, which is a list of specific transactions determined by law that no subjective element, such as fraud, intent, knowledge of the insolvency, is required to avoid these transactions, both by the debitor and by the contractor. These transactions are ineffective against insolvency state when made in the legal date or suspicious period. Just to summarize, these are the following. Payment of undue debts made by the company which in the legal date or suspicious period. Payment of due debts made differently from what was set in the appropriate agreement. The real estate guarantee rights set which in the legal date related to previous debts. Gratuitous acts made two years prior to the legal date. The legal renouncement of heritage made by the bankruptcy part two years prior to the legal date. The transfer or sale of the company's factory without payment or consentment of the, the company's creditors. The enrollment of real estate rights and real estate transfers made after the legal date and that are not related to matters that existed prior to this date. In this case, according to section 129, the ineffectiveness can be declared by the bankruptcy court, the bankruptcy judge, ex officio, which owes the competence to declare such, a transactions, such transactions ineffective. Also, as a claim or defense by the bankrupt state, any creditor 
the public prosecutor or insolvency administrator. Thus, in this case, the law does not require any specific formality for challenging these transactions. So the main problems I would like to try to answer is, what happens if a contract concluded by the debtor prior to the opening of insolvency proceeding contains an arbitration clause to discuss any question regard regarding to those claims? In this context, would it be the administrator, any other creditor, or the prosecutor bound by the clause to be obliged to argue the, ineffective, the ineffectiveness of the transactions or the void of such a clause in arbitration? And putting it differently, is, there, is this arbitration agreement enforceable vis-a-vis -vis the insolvency administrator, or can the insolvency administrator avoid the, that contract as a whole based on grounds provided by Section 129 in bank, Bankruptcy Court? So, hard to answer, but I will try. One of the effects of insolvency is the ineffectiveness of the list that I just mentioned before of the transactions settled in Article uh, Section 129. Those transactions are ineffective by law. Usually, the arbitration agreement does not cover disputes arising from the exercise of the right to avoid the list of uh, the de of those transactions, according to Section 109. And in the case that parties agree to discuss such issues in arbitration previously, that would definitely be a discussion about intention to defraud creditors, assuming that at the moment the debtor was not insolvent. And obviously, obviously they were preventing such a situation. As such, as an agreement between the insolvent part and one or more of its creditors cannot include nor exclude the application of those rules, uh, it cannot be possible. In short, rules regulating the effects of insolvency are mandatory and cannot be contracted out by parts, not even by way of arbitration. The trustee or any other creditor cannot be bound by an arbitration clause concluded by the debtor prior to the opening of insolvency proceeding. The dispute is not considering to arise out of the contract between the debtor and contractor pra contracting part. In fact, it concerns a statutory right granted to the insolvency administrator, any creditor, or prosecutor, as I said previously. In sum, it's not the disposal right of the debtor. The list of transactions are in effect by law, so in case of such agreement, which includes the duty to discuss those issues on arbitration, the agreement is not valid because, again, it's non-disposable right. The second provision is uh, 130, which provides the possibility to avoid acts that were made prior to the opening of insolvency proceeding proving that the transaction was made with the intention to defraud creditors, both by the debtor and contracting part. In this case, section one, okay. in this case, section 132 status that any challenge concerning section 130 can be invoked by the trustee, the prosecutor, or any other creditor. Accordingly, these are statutory powers conferring by the bankruptcy law. In addition, section 134 statutes that any transaction challenged under section 130 must be challenged in the state court and follow the civil procedural code. In other words, the avoidance based on Article 130 has the visa trativa concursus of bankruptcy court. So in the situation of section 130, even in the case of fraud from the contracting part prior to the opening of the insolvency proceeding, which is not derivative from the debtor, section 134 status that it must be challenged in the state court. The competence is exclusive to the state court to appreciate these claims. <laughs> 
So any provision related to the arbitrability of avoidance claim would be regarding to insolvency law, and it's considerably a cause of action. Two, when exercising the avoidance power, the trustee does not institute the cause of actions that are inherent from the debtor and which der der derive from the underlying contract. Therefore, it's appropriate to say Therefore, it's appropriate to say that the arbitration clause cannot bound creditors nor the administrator in such claims, considering these are creation of bankruptcy law. They are not claims that the debtor could have asserted if no bankruptcy proceeding has been instituted. As such, again, there are no disposable rights. In this context, it's interesting to mention that it's clear that the line between avoidance and arbitration concerning to avoidance claims is uncertain in relation to insolvency doctrine and procedural law. Now, citing Professor Stefan Crow, there is a strong public interest involved in insolvency proceeding. Two, whenever conflicts with the crucial principles of insolvency law are unavailable, it will, in most countries, be the arbitration proceedings which have to give away. Insofar, it's possible to establish a hierarchy of provisions where, in case of conflict, the insolvency principle prevails. In sum, my main points is that the current state of Brazilian law does not leave an opening for arbitrability of avoidance claims neither under section 129 nor section 130. This is mainly because section 139 are creation of bankruptcy law and no disposal right. And under section 120, 30, the law status it must be claimed in bankruptcy court and it cannot be deviated from by contract agreement. Is it desirable Shall it continue to be like that? I give you with these questions for further discussions because I do not have the answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Gadig. Thank you for your <clears throat> explanation. And now I'm pleased to call here Professor Maria de Lourdes Pereira. She is a tenured assistant professor at Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de Lisboa, Lisbon School of Law, where she has lectured regularly since 1994, probably when she was 12 years old. She's currently in charge of the courses of law obligations under graduation. Uh, toward law, masters in commercial law, masters and PhD. As an academic, she has taught different courses and publishes in a wide range of topics within private law, including contract law, law of damages, and insolvency law. She has also been active as a practitioner in Albuquerque Almeida, Associados, a law firm, and she's a member of Portuguese Bar Association since 1996. So, uh, Professor Medellurgis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I thank the flattering words of uh, Professor Satiro, uh, and I would like to uh, to start to, to my, my, my presentation uh, with uh, a big thank for, for being invited here to Hamburg. Um, I'm very grateful to those who organized this uh, uh, conference. So Professor Stefan Kroll, Prof Professor Reinhard Borg, and also Professor uh, Francisco Satiro. Uh, 
Um, it's both an honor and a, a pleasure to be here, uh, and also a, a, a responsibility, of course. Uh, I, as uh, well, we, we, we dealt with uh, a lot of issues uh, today. Uh, my presentation will deal uh, with some of them, uh, and uh, so will not be uh, uh, any will not be different from the others. But uh, my my main point is to analyze the issues from the perspective of Portuguese law. Um, so I will share. I, I shall explore the effects of insolvency over a pre-existent arbitration agreement to which the debtor is part and its consequences on both proceedings, so arbitration and insolvency proceedings. Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, Portuguese Insolvency Code has a special provision on this issue and the first question may bear very well be if it's necessary or at least prudent to have a legal provision uh, about this uh, issue. Um, I believe this is a reasonable option, and from th this point of view, Portuguese law has taken the right approach. Um, note that a special provision on pending litigation and on litigation after the insolvency declaration is a common feature among uh, insolvency domestic laws. Uh, so it, it could be argued that this general provision, uh, which is designed for claims in state courts, could be in extensively construed in order to include arbitration. This is a, at least a way of dealing with this uh, problem. However, I think that would be uh, too broad an interpretation uh, because there is a difference between arbitration proceedings and state courts proceedings, and the main difference is that arbitration uh, has uh, 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 an agreement of the parties, and this, this, this agreement would be disregarded if the law uh, uh, states that any claims must be made before the state courts after an insolvency declaration. So. Uh, arbitration is based on uh, party autonomy, and there, there must be a sensible reason not to uphold the pacta sum servanda principle. So that's why I think that uh, the, the, the provision on pending litigation on, and on litigation after the declaration of insolvency cannot be extensively interpreted to, to uh, uh, be applied to uh, the, the arbitration uh, proceedings. However, uh, I must uh, confess that drafting a rule uh, concerning the effect of insolvency on arbitration agreements is not an easy job. Uh, in fact, uh, it should take conflicting ideas or interests into account, into consideration, and some of them point in different directions. I think that that's the main uh, difficulty uh, of drafting a rule on this uh, matter. So uh, I think, oh, uh, I, I missed uh, 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 a, a part of my speech. Uh, so uh, how, when drafting a, a rule, uh, one should consider at least four, uh, four uh, ideas or arguments or interests. The first one is that insolvency law is designed to allow a centralization of claims, which ensures an equal treatment of creditors. This is the main uh, feature, or, or one of the main features, or the core features of insolvency law. Also, arbitration is based on party autonomy. Promises should be kept. So this is the pacta sum servanda uh, principle. Uh, also, the, uh, the third point, which it's that insolvency uh, uh, administrator replaces the debtor in managing the insolvency in state. This also uh, uh, has its consequences over uh, uh, an arbitration uh, 
uh, independently if it is an arbitration that was pending at the time the insolvency is declared or uh, an arbitration that is initiated after the declaration. And uh, also the administration, the, administration, the administrator takes up the legal position of the debtor, of the debtor as it stands. Thus, I think that in principle, uh, uh, the administrator is bound by, the, uh, uh, by any arbitration agreements. I will not discuss here what does mean to be bound, uh, but uh, it has to, 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 to uh, obey the, to the arbitration agreements. So these are sometimes conflicting uh, um, uh, arguments, and uh, especially it's not clear if Portuguese uh, insolvency code has chosen a balanced solution. At least one can suspect that the lawmaker was not fully aware of all the problems that uh, uh, insolvency brings to uh, 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 the enforceability of an arbitration agreement. So I think that this is the main uh, criticism, criticism that one can make when uh, dealing with uh, the express provision that uh, uh, insolvency, uh, Portuguese, uh, Portuguese insolvency code has. So let us uh, face this, look, like, let us look uh, to the express provision, it's Article 87. It was referred to uh, many times uh, today. Um, Article 87, the first number, uh, uh, states that the efficacy of arbitration agreements of which the debt debtor is part is suspended uh, in respect of claims that may affect the value of the estate, notwithstanding uh, international treaties. Uh, and then number two, however, this is a deviation, uh, claims pending on the date of the declaration of insolvency shall continue without prejudice of some uh, uh, numbers uh, of uh, another article of the law. So uh, I think that five conclusions uh, uh, may be uh, drew, uh, may be drawn uh, from this uh, uh, provision. Portuguese Insolvency Code makes a distinction between pending arbitrations at the time the insolvency is declared and any claims that are submitted to, to an arbitral tribunal after that date. Second, pending arbitrations are to be continued even after the declaration of insolvency, no matter the object of the claims or counterclaims. So, and in this case, or in a few cases uh, where the arbitration continues, uh, the, the pending arbitration, the administrator shall replace the debtor. Um, third uh, point, uh, or third conclusion, uh, arbitrations that may have an impact of, on the value of the estate cannot be initiated after the insolvency declaration. Uh, Fourth, uh, arbitrations that cannot affect the value of the estate may be initiated even before, even after the declaration of insolvency. So, as a conclusion, the declaration of insolvency does not cancel any arbitration agreements the debtor entered into before uh, uh, the declaration. Um, however, the efficacy or the enforceability of these agreements is restricted. It's uh, uh, restricted at least during the uh, insolvency proceedings. Uh, although these solutions may be simple, uh, some doubts arise, and I will uh, uh, deal with this with some questions. And for the sake of time, I will not address all the issues and all the difficult problems that arise from this uh, regulation. I will uh, only uh, uh, deal with three uh, questions. So the first one uh, was uh, already, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. The first one was, was already uh, um, uh, addressed uh, during the morning, which is the, the, the effect of the lack of funds 
on the enforceability of the uh, uh, arbitral agreement. So is it possible for the de debtor to challenge the jurisdiction of an arbitral tribunal by asserting his lack of funds? Uh, or is the non-insolvency party prevented from re relying on the arbitral agreement before a state court if the debtor has chosen the, this jurisdiction because he has no sufficient funds to arbitration? Well, I believe uh, this is a, a, a question, uh, of course, that uh, emerges from the, the, the provision that I uh, read uh, previously, because uh, uh, one could say that the provision uh, uh, addresses this problem, and I think not. Um, I believe that said provision of uh, the Portuguese Insolvency Code does not answer this question. Um, so even when uh, uh, an arbitral agreement remains enforceable from the perspective of the insolvency law, from the perspective of Article 87, nothing is said about the problem of the lack of funds. And in fact, this problem, I think it's not a job of insolvency, or insolvency law to solve it, because it's, it's broader than uh, insolvency. So uh, a party may lack funds, although uh, he or she is not insolvent. So uh, the problem is, is not to be answered specifically by insolvency law. So what's the answer? <laughs> well, in fact, the lack of funds uh, of one of the parties uh, should render, in my opinion, the arbitral agreement unenforceable. Uh, otherwise, the, the debtor would be denied uh, access to justice, uh, which is uh, in Portugal a constitutional right. Uh, Portugal, Portuguese courts have steadily decided uh, in this way, although in cases not uh, directly related to insolvency. Uh, so every time the debtor has no, uh, uh, has no funds, uh, for an arbitration, uh, the courts have decided to uh, consider the, the arbitration agreement non, uh, unenforceable or uh, suspended. Um, well, the second question that arises from uh, uh, this set, uh, uh, the second question that I want to address is, uh, uh, arises from a set of provisions of in, uh, Portuguese insolvency law that regulate the impact of insolvency declaration on executory mutual contracts. It was uh, an issue that was already um, uh, well, that was already analyzed. Um, so the condition of the applicability uh, of these rules is that the contract is not fully performed by the debtor and the counterparty at the date when the insolvency is declared. So the administrator is granted the power to decide whether the executory contract uh, shall be performed or not. In a few exceptional cases, the administrator has no option and has to perform the contract. So two different questions arise, and I, uh, uh, or unfortunately or fortunately, I, I, I made the same distinction that uh, Professor Vesna made in her uh, presentation. So two different questions arise from this, uh, 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 from this regulation on executory mutual contracts. So the first one is whether an arbitration agreement is an executory mutual contract. And the second one concerns an arbitration agreement that is part of an executory mutual contract, contract and asks if it must share the same fate as the contract. Well, some Portuguese law scholars uh, assert that the arbitral agreement is in fact an executory mutual contract and that the administrator has the power to decide whether the, the uh, arbitration agreement remains in force or not, even if Article 87 states that the uh, arbitration agreement is uh, 
suspended or not suspended, depending on the, 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 the case or depending on the claim. Um, well, um, and other experts uh, or other scholars, uh, uh, to say, uh, um, to be precise, claim that the, uh, if the administrator is forced uh, by the law to perform the contract, uh, so the arbitral agreement uh, could not or cannot be suspended because of this uh, uh, decision. So the contract fully remains in force with uh, the uh, uh, arbitral agreement uh, in it. Well, in my view, uh, arbitral agreements cannot be considered executory and mutual contracts for the purposes of uh, this regime. Uh, executory uh, contracts are contracts that are not fully performed by either of the parties, uh, which, however, in theory, could be already be performed by the time insolvency is declared. If that was the case, they would not be executory contracts, of course. So, um, but the arbitral agreement, uh, uh, on the contrary, cannot be performed. The concept of performance does not apply, uh, at least in a rigorous sense, to the arbitral agreement. Uh, this agreement is an agreement that establishes that whenever a legal dispute arises between the parties, uh, it will be ruled by a special uh, jurisdiction. So it cannot be performed or fully performed before the declaration of insolvency. Uh, and additionally, uh, an arb the arbitration agreement is not a contract with reciprocal uh, obligations. That's why it's not a mutual contract. Uh, that's another reason not to apply uh, this uh, uh, set of rules that uh, grant the administrator the power to, uh, to uh, decide the, the fate of the contract. Well, regarding the second problem, is there any contradiction between uh, the partial uh, suspension of uh, arbitration agreements uh, upon the declaration of insolvency and the mandatory performance uh, of some contracts by uh, the administrator. Some scholars say, say that that is contradictory and uh, tend to uh, uh, conclude or reach the conclusion that uh, 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 the administrator have, has to uh, uh, um, impose the, the or has to has to to choose the uh, arbitral tribunal uh, if he wants uh, to challenge anything that's on the contract. Well, I believe there is no such a, a conflict between regulations. Uh, imposing the performance of a contract means that each party will uh, get what was promised. But once again, words like promised and performance uh, do not fully match with arbitration agreements, in my opinion. Uh, moreover, the arbitration agreement is independent to a certain extent from the uh, uh, contract which contains it. Uh, the contract may be void and the arbitration agreement remains valid, uh, valid and vice versa. So it's not logically or legally contradictory to enforce a contract and simultaneously suspend the arbitration ag agreement and vice versa. Well, the, th the third question, I, there was a, a problem with my presentation uh, and I couldn't solve the problem here uh, in Germany. Uh, so, uh, well, it's the mandatory continuation of pending arbitrations and the centralization of claims. A actually, uh, Portuguese, Portuguese law, uh, as I uh, uh, said before, uh, uh, states that any pending arbitration shall uh, continue. Uh, but the problem is to reconcile this uh, provision uh, with the, the, the centralization uh, of claims. In fact, um, insolvency is based on uh, centralization of claims, 
because it's the only way to ensure uh, equal treatment of the insolvency creditors. And therefore, under the Portuguese uh, insolvency code, a creditor does not, that does not file a claim in the insolvency proceedings loses the right uh, of being paid under these proceedings. Um, after the opening of the uh, insolvency proceeding, proceedings, the creditors who want uh, to be considered, who want their credits to be considered, must file their claims uh, with the, the administrator but the final decision regarding the existence and the ranking of the credits belongs to a state court, which is the insolvency court. And the same applies if a credit is challenged by a creditor. The state court has competence over this uh, 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 dispute uh, about the uh, existence or uh, anything that uh, pertains uh, the credit. And decisions of uh, the insolvency court are binding to the insolvency administrator and also to all insolvency creditors. So these rules, to say the least, seem to place the creditor that previously submitted the claim to an arbitral tribunal in an adverse position so the creditor may submit his claim to the insolvency administrator but apparently has no right to have that credit enforced and recognized by a state court, uh, at least before he uh, gets the, or, or he has the, the, the arbitral award. Um, uh, and at the same time, the state court, court that has jurisdiction over the insolvency has uh, uh, Nothing on the law says that the, 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 the proceedings uh, have to stay or have to wait for the arbitral award. So this at least uh, uh, makes the, the position of the creditor uh, uh, very uh, difficult. But I, but I believe that the, the major difficulty is with the other creditors. Uh, any insolvency creditor has the right to challenge the credit concern on an ongoing or in an ongoing uh, arbitration. And since the creditor is not bound by the uh, uh, arbitral agreement, the only way of doing this is before the state court involved in the insolvency proceedings. The creditor that challenges the credit under arbitration cannot be forced to accept uh, uh, and to intervene in the pending uh, arbitration. He is ultimately, at least in my opinion, securing his own credit. And uh, the corp one of the core principles of arbitration is that an arbitral tribunal only has jurisdiction over the persons who freely accepted said jurisdiction. So when the law uh, declares that pending arbitration shall continue, it completely ignores the uh, set of problems that arise when the claim under arbitration refers to a creditor against the debtor. Well, I know I don't have any definite answer to this uh, dilemma. I'm tempted to say that uh, Article 87 is a general rule, and whenever uh, 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 an arbitration uh, uh, is related to a credit uh, that is under dispute. Uh, the, the court, uh, uh, the, 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 the state court may terminate, or uh, the administrator, to, to, to be correct, may terminate the pending arbitra arbitral proceedings. Um, so I shall end my presentation with my opening remarks. It is prudent to have a specific rule concerning arbitration agreements in insolvency law. However, the drafting of a rule is not an easy task because there are conflicting principles, interests, or interests. And finally, uh, in my view, um, Article 87 from the Portuguese Insolvency Code uh, raises more doubts than uh, solves 
problems. So thank you very much for your attention. Great, after th three great presentations and, and with the dialogue among them, um, I now open for questions. Um, we have so many um, new issues that, has been at, that have been addressed here. And is there any question or someone would like to to? Answer some? Yes, please. Uh, just one moment. Mic microphone is coming. Thank you to the, to the three of you for, for uh, insightful presentations. I, I have um, two questions, if I may. One is a comment on Article 87. I don't know whether you're aware. I believe it's, it's, a, it's just a reproduction of the, of the provision that we have in the Spanish law, Article 56 of the Spanish Insolvency Act says exactly the same. I was just translated into Portuguese insolvency law. Now, Spanish law abandoned that regime 10 years ago to more pro-arbitration, but the same questions that you're posing have been existing in the Spanish literature for the last 10 or 15 years. And I think you're asking the right questions. Uh, uh, so, well, I, I will not know is whether the answers um, will be the same in Portuguese or not, but there is one, one point that was controversial in Spain, which is <coughs> Article 87.1 says no withstanding international treaties. And the Spanish law that was subject to a, a lot of discussion saying Article 87 then is purely dedicated to domestic arbitration. As soon as we have an international arbitration case, then this does not apply and arbitration should continue. And I don't know what your views are on that, but because the reality is that international treaties don't regulate insolvency in arbitration. So that's one question. If, Anna, if, I, if, you, if you may ask Please. the second one, and then you can combine them. Um, the second one concerns avoidance actions, um, and which is we have been dealing with arbitrability of them, and they have been dealt with this morning too. But what happens when they are brought by way of defense or a counterclaim? That is, a creditor brings a claim against the insolvent party, the administrator, and the administrator says, I oppose that claim, not only on the merits, but also because the transaction upon which that claim is based should be avoided. Therefore, we have an arbitrable contractual claim and a potentially non-arbitrable defense. Is that a situation which should kill the arbitration altogether? Or is that a situation in which we should fragment the arbitration and the counterclaim? Or is that a matter with where the counterclaim is purely incidental as opposed to the main subject matter and therefore the arbitration could go ahead. Thank you for the question. Um, Thank you. Please. Thank you for the question. Actually, well, uh, uh, there is a, an ongoing discussion about this, uh, the last part of the article. I was not fully aware of uh, that, uh, that the article is a translation from the Spanish law. Actually, our insolvency code uh, has a, a lot of uh, influences and uh, inspirations and the part of the executory mutual contracts it has a, a strong uh, influence from German law, uh, which is interesting. So I didn't know, I must confess. Uh, but uh, uh, there is an ongoing, yes, uh, discussion uh, and uh, 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 for for uh, non-domestic or international uh, um, insolvency proceedings, uh, uh, authors or uh, um, scholars uh, uh, tend to 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 apply uh, this part of the of the article, but not to domestic insolvency. So, uh, uh, if. Uh, even if uh, under uh, international laws uh, the, the arbitral agreement remains enforceable, uh, 
and has to be respected. Uh, that doesn't affect uh, uh, domestic uh, uh, insolvency proceedings. I don't know if I answered your question. Okay. okay. Would you like to talk about the second one? Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, I don't know. You know, uh, for, for a sake, uh, I will not uh, uh, deal with the second, so I just wanted to comment also uh, briefly on the previous law in, in, in Spain, which had uh, identical provision. Interesting is that there is a decision of this Barcelona court uh, in which that was refused to be applied in the international context. So simply it was applied just for the purposes of insolvency proceedings and arbitration within the Spain without the intention of applying that or even tending to apply internationally. So that may be also some parallel with them. So for the second, uh, well, if you like, please go ahead. <laughs> go on. So. Right, just go on. Thanks for your interesting question. Actually, if I understood properly, it is related to a claim that is, was brought from a creditor and then the trustee wants to avoid this claim, right? It has to be done, as my view, even if it's under section 129 or 130, which means fraud, on the bankruptcy court. We had a situation in Brazil that an arbitration uh, award established set-offs among creditors, and it was made in the suspicious period, legal, legal term, as we used to say. This uh, award was, um, they, they tried to avoid, to null, considering this transaction was ineffective, according to uh, section 129, and indeed it was not a null. But the transaction is still remains ineffective. And this decision was made by the bankruptcy judge because it's the only one who has competence to decide in such cases, even if the claim arose in a, a contract with arbitration agreement. Did I? is arbitrable, but not when, arbit when competition law is the core of, or the cause of action that generates the arbitration. So in this case, the inarbitrable insolvency matter is only brought by way of defense as an incidental question. Yeah. Will we then arbitrate it? Uh, maybe, if I just, as a matter, of course, not to, to Please, no reference to Brazilian law, mm -hmm. uh, so I wouldn't know. But I would just uh, think in the matter of, as a matter of principle. Um, so if there is a, a attempt of the trustee to avoid and if that is avoided, then I'm afraid that that would be the end of the story. But if there is an unsuccessful attempt to treat it as an avoidance transaction under insolvency law, then we would have a, a just ordinary creditor, I, I guess non-secured and non-preferred, who invokes that arbitration clause. So the arbitration clause would not necessarily be, be so, as you say, killed. But it would depend, if, if, uh, depend on whether there we really speak about the avoidance transaction or not. And if so, then I, I would say that it would be then the object of, uh, of uh, outside of the uh, of uh, arbitra uh, uh, arbitration. But the thing is that non-arbitrability is different thing from binding nature. So we don't think that this is non-arbitrable because uh, insolvency petitioners should be free to agree on that with the consent of the court or creditors committee. But another matter is binding nature of arbitration agreements in such transactions which are inconceivable, in my view. Yeah, um, and, and I have some doubts about um, the avoidance being an accessory aspect of the, the, the claim, the proof of claims. Maybe it's the opposite, because if, he, if, if, if it's a case for avoidance, so there's no reason to discuss the claims Otherwise, if you discuss the claim, the, the, the credit, even even defining the credit, um, the avoidance may um, interfere with the result of the judgment. So maybe that, sh and and I'm just thinking with a pencil, not with a pen. Uh, maybe um, that should be considered 
uh, the credit issue should be considered a necessary question to the avoidance issue, maybe. Mm, any other question? Do we have questions? Oh, yes, we have one question here. Um, you want my microphone? Oh, yeah. It's okay. Oh. <laughs> we can. Yeah. You see, another um, come very quick. Okay, so in your... Um, and when you were explaining some basis of the uh, arbitration, you, you, uh, among the five, you said that arbitrations that may have an impact on the value of the state cannot be initiated. And I wonder, who decides that? Is it the court that it's responsible for, it, for the insolvency um, procedure, or um, the creditor would open a, a would open an a, a arbitrary? Uh, claim and that would be discussed uh, prelim uh, in, on preliminary states, like if it is competence, competence, if that should be decided here or there, and in in the case that they choose to go both way, who who would solve this? That's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, I never thought about that. <laughs> I must say. <laughs> but uh, well, that, that, that's an interesting. Uh, and and uh, if uh, uh, you have both procedures, and uh, uh, of course, I would say that. Well, the first thing is that, uh, uh, although I need to to, to uh, think more about in depth about this uh, subject, uh, that uh, an arbitral tribun tribunal that has its place in Portugal is bound by, by the insolvency code. So it has to accept that it has no competence over uh, this specific claim. Um, um, uh, so th if the, the question uh, or the claim is uh, uh, made before an arbitral tribunal, the arbitral tribunal will decide whether uh, the, the claim has some impact on the value of the estate or not. Uh, if not, it would be, uh, so if the question is uh, 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 raised uh, before a state court, I think that the state court would be, uh, would have competence to decide the question. But yes, it, it's interesting and it's possible, uh, well, it, it could be possible, possible to, to have contradictory or, or opposite judgments, of course. That's the, the main difficulty. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I think we're on time. Yeah, so thank you very much for all your presentations. They were great. And now we have a break. And we will be back in 3.45. So thank you very much. Okay, welcome back to the second afternoon session for today. We have as our speaker um, someone from, as I was always told when I go to the local football stadium, the most beautiful city in Germany, Cologne. Uh, that's from the football stadium. I'm not saying that that may be my, my view of that, but that's the place where I live. Uh, professor Tole is professor of, at law, of law at Cologne University. He serves there as the managing director of the Institute of Procedural Law and Insolvency Law and in the Institute of European and International Insolvency Law. His research focus, his research interests focus on procedural and insolvency law, and he studied law at the universities of Bayreuth and Münster, received his doctoral degree from the University of Bonn, where he also completed his habilitation in 2009. Since then, he has been first university professor in Tübingen in 2000, since 2010 and came in 2016 to Cologne. And we're very pleased that you found the way to Hamburg today, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Christoph, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me as a speaker. Um, a lot has been said already today, and so there, there might be some redundancy, uh, redundancies. My apologies in advance, but I will try to add a few more aspects uh, on post-petition agreements. Now, when I started work on my presentation, at first I thought this topic is not so interesting at all, or at least, uh, at least much less relevant than pre-petition agreements. And indeed, post-petition agreements have not received much attention. 
But the more you look into it, the more questions arise, and I want to raise a few of these questions today in my presentation. Now, first of all, let me begin by defining what a post-petition agreement actually is. Obviously, we are talking about arbitration clauses that the administrator or liquidator has agreed to. For instance, if the administrator buys material or goods for the estate, for, for the company, in order to carry on the business, and the contract that has been drafted contains an arbitration clause. However, we may also treat, at least from a doctrinal pers perspective, as new uh, post-petition agreements situations in which an administrator expressly or indirectly consents to the continuation of a pre-petition agreement and an uh, arbitration agreement that has been concluded by the debtor. As, at least from a doctrinal perspective, such continuation or the decision to consent to the continuation may be treated as a new contract and may render the pre-petition agreement into a post-petition agreement, or at least it may be equivalent to such a uh, post-petition agreement. There may also be an overlap between pre-petition and post-petition uh, agreements, um, at least, once again, theoretically. Um, such a situation may occur where the administrator, for instance, brings a claim based on a fresh new arbitration agreement, and now the opponent files a counterclaim based on a pre-petition agreement concluded by the debtor, or vice versa, the other party has brought a claim against the debtor, and that uh, claim has been stayed upon the opening of the insolvency proceeding and then proceeded with by the administrator. And now the administrator brings a counterclaim based on a different contract uh, that includes a post-petition, a new arbitration agreement. Now let us talk about the powers and the capacity to enter into a new post-petition agreement. Who is party to such an agreement? That is not as trivial as it sounds um, because it leads to the very nature of the office, of uh, the office of the administrator. Often um, the liquidator or administrator is more or less perceived as the legal successor of the debtor or as the representative of the debtor stepping into his shoes. We, we were talking about this uh, earlier today. However, under German law, the liquidator is not representing the debtor, but he acts ex officio, so-called Amtstheorie. The liquidator himself is a party to legal proceedings that relate to the estate, not the debtor represented by the liquidator. In practical terms, it might be all the same, but still it's a doctrinal uh, distinction we have to make. Now, most uh, jurisdictions seem to grant the liquidator or administrator the capacity to enter into a new, fresh post-petition agreement. They also allow for the administrator to adopt certain pre-petition agreements concluded by the debtor. In German law, this power can be deduced from paragraph 160 of the Insolvency Code. Katharina was uh, referring to that uh, earlier today. <coughs> Um, paragraph 160 of the Insolvency Code requires the office holder to reach the consent of the creditor committee to the arbitration agreement, at least in um, situations where there, there is some importance and relevance for the estate. Thus, um, we can follow from this that the liquidator may enter into a post-petition agreement, but he needs to meet some additional requirements, such as the consent of the creditor committee. The same holds true for English law. It is explicitly stated in paragraph 5 and 6 of Schedule 1 to the Insolvency Act, and in paragraph 4 to Schedule 4, that the liquidator, and likewise the administrator, have the power to refer a dispute to arbitration and thus to enter into an arbitration agreement. However, this general principle is subject to exemptions and my firm belief is that is where the real issues are with respect to the scope of arbitrability and procedural safeguards. 
Now, before addressing these exemptions in more detail, <clears throat> let me turn to the underlying principles and goals of insolvency law. We had that today, of course, but um, my question is, do post-petition agreements come into a conflict with the very nature of insolvency proceedings as a debt enforcement mechanism? Now, it's important to know that the goals of insolvency law are not always the same in each and every jurisdiction. For instance, the French law <clears throat> puts more emphasis on social, uh, political values, more on the employees than other jurisdictions that aim primarily or even exclusively on realizing the best outcome for creditors. That is, for instance, provided for by paragraph one of the German insolvency code. However, to, to, to be sure, the best possible creditor satisfaction certainly is a key goal of all insolvency laws around the world, notwithstanding secondary goals that are being pursued. Some um, jurisdiction might be more debtor-friendly, others more creditor-friendly, but at the end of the day, it's always about how you affect creditor rights. Against this background, in my opinion, the goal of creditor protection does not in itself pose an obstacle to arbitration and insolvency proceedings. Arbitration is a full alternative to ordinary proceedings before state courts. It's based on the premise of party autonomy and as such can be fully consistent with the attempt to maximize the return for creditors. At least, and that's my point, there is no general rule to the effect that arbitration is detrimental, whereas pursuing claims before state courts is not. In some cases, of course, arbitration might not be a good idea, but that is entirely different from saying that um, arbitration would run um, in a fu fundamental conflict with insolvency policies. Um, we talked about the goals of insolvency law earlier. I can uh, leave that or uh, more or less skip this part. Um, we all know that insolvency is uh, an, or adds an element of public ordering, whereas arbitration is a, a kind of private ordering. Um, we also see an element of concentration in insolvency. The creditors form a common pool. It's sort of a collective style of dispute resolution, so to speak, uh, whereas arbitration tends to be decentralized as it is dependent on a specific arbitration agreement in a specific case with single parties. But once again, despite these differences, there's no fundamental principle of insolvency law that would restrict the conclusion of post-petition agreements on a general level. So we have to look into the issues more closely and in more detail. Now, what are the specific restrictions for post-petition agreements? Well, as we have heard today, many jurisdictions do indeed distinguish between pre-petition agreements and post-petition agreements, or at least between uh, proceedings uh, pending at the time of the opening of the proceeding and proceedings commenced afterwards. Some jurisdictions, um, like Germany, <clears throat> treat pre-petition agreements as enforceable against the IP, the insolvency practitioner, unless, we've heard that earlier uh, before the coffee break, unless the claim relates to an insolvency-specific matter, to a core insolvency issue, for instance. Uh, in German law, um, an agreement remains valid and binding on the office holder unless it relates to the original powers of the trustees, such as avoidance actions or disputes concerning the termination of contracts. On the other hand, pursuant to Article or Section 349 of the English Insolvency Act, the trustee in personal bankruptcy is granted the right not to adopt an arbitration clause, at least by way of application to the court. So what we see here is that at least for certain situations, avoidance powers, etc., uh, the law tries to protect the, um, the office holder, tries to protect uh, or to, to make sure that there is a degree of flexibility for the office holder and a protection of his genuine insolvency powers. This power to get rid of certain pre-petition agreements aims at maximizing the estate. And that brings me to the conclusion that if the officeholder is not bound 
by an earlier agreement, this does not mean, as a general principle, that the officeholder is under an obligation to refrain from making use of the pre-petition agreement. Pre-petition agreements may lose their binding effect on the estate, but the administrator may still make use of it post-commencement. So we have to distinguish between the lack of a binding effect of a pre-petition agreement and the power of the office holder to still make use of it. Um, that are two different questions. Now, um, a different question then is whether and under what conditions the administrator may enter into a new agreement. First of all, um, of course, the power to conclude new agreements is restricted by the general scope of arbitrability. As, for instance, just to name an example outlined in Article 2060 of the French Code Civil. Uh, Post-petition agreements do not reach further than the general scope of arbitration in a re respective jurisdiction. For instance, uh, said um, Article 2060 of the French Code Civil mentions a few areas of law where arbitration is not allowed, such as personal matters or matters concerning public enterprises. Thus, uh, the general scope of arbitrability is the same here than outside of insolvency. There may also be, as mentioned earlier, there may also be procedural boundaries. Often, local insolvency law would require the administrator of the estate to be authorized by the court or by uh, the creditors uh, committee before consenting to a binding agreement. In Germany, the lack of an approval by the creditors committee does not, in, does not render the claim or the agreement invalid, but it might lead to the conclusion that agreeing to the arbitration clause or initiating the claim uh, in arbitration was a breach of duty of care by the administrator. In other jurisdictions like Belgium law and French law, the leave of the court is required for the um, agreement, for instance, as stated in Article 622 of the C French Commercial Code. Thus, what we see here is that insolvency law is a gatekeeper to arbitration. Arbitration within in an insolvency proceeding is possible, but it requires the approval of the relevant bodies. By the way, um, what we have not seen under German law, at least, uh, is uh, arbitration clauses in restructuring plans or insolvency plans. Um, that doesn't happen in, in German uh, plan proceedings. Um, and I doubt whether that would be possible. Uh, or at least whether it would have a binding effect on the minority creditors, um, because the range of measures you, you, you can take in an insolvency plan proceeding is mandated by paragraph 217 of the insolvency code, and it doesn't mention uh, arbitration clauses, so that might not be possible, but uh, I found that a very interesting <coughs> discussion earlier today. Now, um, I would like to mention, and it's important to, to keep in mind, that even besides all the legal requirements, uh, the specific ones, the administrator is also bound by the general duty of care. The administrator is under a general duty to perform his job with a reasonable degree of duty and skill. Now, this um, duty of care entails that the administrator is obliged to maximize the estate and to reach the best possible outcome for creditors. And that is linked to our topic here because one of the duties that follow from this general duty of care is a duty to seek out and to assert claims. Generally speaking, the administrator might be held liable if he or she does not assert claims that are worth pursuing. Whenever there is a predominant likelihood of success and there are no contraindications, the administrator must pursue the claim in order to maximize the estate, unless, of course, the enforcement of uh, the later judgment would be too time-consuming or otherwise uh, problematic. On the other hand, um, it is well established that in an insolvency scenario, the administrator and office holder is required to use the funds of the estate sensibly and to enter into transactions only if they are economically reasonable. For instance, in a judgment of March 22, 22 uh, the German Federal um, Court of Justice 
uh, held a trustee liable for a transaction that, despite a level of discretion, was not reasonable in terms of costs. Now, what does this mean for post-petition agreements? We have established that in most jurisdictions, the administrator may enter into a new uh, agreement subject to procedural requirements and subject to the scope of arbitrability. But even given such standing and competence, that is not to say that, at least theoretically, uh, that the entering into such an agreement may not be a breach of duty of care in a specific case. And that also applies to protocols, it also applies to intergroup arbitration agreements. So that leads to the further question of which considerations an administrator or liquidator needs to make when contemplating a post-petition agreement. And uh, Katerina talked about this um, in our first presentation today. Um, I will try to, to just focus on, on a few aspects. And one major issue here is, of course, cost. Um, as we all know, arbitration may be expensive, but bringing a claim before state courts may be expensive too. And sometimes arbitration may even be cheaper because we don't have an uh, appeal uh, possibility. Um, at least there is no general rule to the effect, uh, and it all depends on the specific case, the amount is in dispute, the questions of appeals, and so forth. Thus, seen from an ex-ante perspective, <clears throat> the administrator is not under a duty to refrain from using arbitration simply because it might be uh, expensive or because it is generally perceived as being expensive. Um, also, we, we all know, and we talked about this, that arbitration might provide for more expediency, and as you all know, that is a factor, factor most relevant in insolvency proceedings. Time is of the essence, and that is why arbitration might be useful in a specific case. On the other hand, in some cases, arbitrations, uh, arbitration proceedings might not be useful because, for instance, the matter in dispute is interrelated to other matters that are not subject to the arbitration agreement or linked to third parties that are not bound by the arbitration agreement. In such a scenario, it might be unwise to enter into a new, fresh arbitration agreement with one of these parties uh, because that will make it necessary to pursue claims um, both before the arbitral uh, tribunal and before state courts. I would also like to draw your attention to an interrelationship with funding issues, which in my op opinion is quite important. In German civil procedure law, a claimant or a defendant enjoys the right to receive sta state funding and legal aid for the proceeding. The court fees and attorney fees may be waived or reduced or funded by the state if the applicant is unable to provide funds for the proceeding himself. And this also applies to the administrator or liquidator if and when the estate is poor and unable to fund the proceeding, uh, which of course in an insolvency setting is quite often the case. Now, as legal aid is not available in arbitration, um, at least not to a full extent. I know that some arbitration institutes have, have a similar system, for instance, the Court of Arbitration of Sport, but um, not, not fully comparable. At least the lack of legal aid is, of course, a factor that the administrator definitely needs to take into account. And in some cases, it might be even decisive, um, because if you have legal aid, state proceedings more or less come for free for the estate. But just to be clear, not in all legal proceedings, state funding and legal aid is um, granted simply because we have an insolvency estate and be because the, the debtor is insolvent. Um, in particular, in recent years, the German Federal Court of Justice has emphasized that the administrator needs to show in detail why the estate is not able to fund the dispute. Um, well, as I said, however, if legal aid is in reach, this is a factor that definitely needs to be taken into account. But of course, there, there might be other advantages that um, outweigh cost and f funding issues. Um, we talked about confidentiality today. <coughs> um, as a matter of first principles, I would say confidentiality as such is not a problem in an insolvency proceeding. After all, at least uh, that's the way German law sees it, 
The insolvency proceeding in itself is not a public proceeding in the sense that everyone has access to information concerning the running of the proceeding. The creditor's assembly, for instance, is strictly confined or restricted to creditors. Now, as uh, confidentiality is usually a contractual rather than a legal obligation, <clears throat> the effects of insolvency proceedings in this respect are not explicitly regulated in German law. But there are, of course, some obligations placed on the administrator um, by the insolvency code. And that, um, these obligations might indeed come into a conflict with the confidentiality obligation. For instance, where the administrator has to report to the creditors on the ongoing legal uh, proceedings, and this information duty might even entail uh, giving information on specific uh, details of the proceeding. Thus, um, it would have to be made sure that informing these bodies does not constitute a breach of confidentiality. So we will probably not see much arbitration if, if it's not made sure that um, there is a certain degree of transparency. Uh, the administrator needs to be able to talk to the extent that the procedural or insolvency law requires him to. Uh, but it's good to see that, for instance, the rules of the German Arbitration Institute allow for a deviation from strict confidentiality if that is required by the applicable law. So that there might be solutions to this problem. Now, the most um, relevant um, legal impediment to the use of arbitration post-petition is, of course, the arbitrability or the scope of arbitrability in insolvency matters, and we talked about this today quite a lot. Um, I would like to divide this discussion into two different aspects. Um, first of all, it might be possible to draw parallels to the discussion on jurisdiction clauses. As you all know, often jurisdiction clauses on the one end and arbitration clauses on the other hand are treated alike. And the general perception is that where parties are free to conclude a jurisdiction clause, they are also free to enter into an arbitration agreement. Now, jurisdiction clauses are in many jurisdictions prohibited where the state court enjoys an exclusive uh, jurisdiction to the effect that the parties may not agree on a different court to have jurisdiction. Uh, and in many insolvency jurisdictions, the legislation provides for such an exclusive jurisdiction of the insolvency court. Uh, and uh, as from what I can see is that in these jurisdictions, it is often said that once the court enjoys exclusive jurisdiction, uh, the insolvency court enjoys inclusive jurisdiction, and jurisdiction clauses are not permitted, the same applies to arbitration clauses. However, that might be a bit too simple. Um, arbitration is, as we all know, a full substitute to legal proceedings before state courts. And that is at least why in German law, exclusive jurisdiction of state courts does not necessarily entail that arbitration is not possible. It's up to the law of arbitration to decide on the scope of arbitrability. Things might be different. There might be a different story where the European insolvency regulation applies. That's, that's another story. I, I don't want to go into detail. But at least there, uh, the scope of arbitrability is not necessarily identical to the scope of jurisdiction clauses. Still, and uh, that is the second aspect, <clears throat> some insolvency-related proceedings may not be arbitrable as mandated by statutory or case law. Some legislations have introduced a list of matters excluded from arbitration. That seems to be the case in the US. In England, there seems to be quite some case law on the arbitrability in such matters. We heard about the Singapore uh, Court of Appeal today, and there are some other cases as well. Um, so then it is developed by case law. In Germany, as mentioned earlier, case law has established that the avoidance powers and the right to terminate contracts must not be affected by pre-petition arbitration clauses. But, as I said, the administrator is free to make use of the pre-petition agreement um, or to enter into such an agreement post-petition. 
Thus, we, we have no general worldwide understanding of the boundaries of post-petition agreements. One of the crucial aspects in this, uh, crucial problems in this respect is um, the lodging and proving of claims. We, we talk, uh, discussed this uh, earlier. Um, this matter is sometimes, or largely even, uh, held to be non-arbitrable. However, we need to distinguish in more detail between the registration of the claim as such, that has to be done with the insolvency practitioner, that is not uh, subject to arbitration, and any subsequent disputes concerning the ranking and validity of the claim. In Germany, it is largely held that such verification claims may be dealt with in arbitration, and sa the same seems to be true for French law. Now, we have that problem, Reinhardt was mentioning it, um, that um, this could lead to um, conflict with the res judicata effect. Uh, in German law, paragraph 183 of the Insolvency Code states that a judgment on the validity or ranking of the claim in a dispute between the liquidator and the um, creditor that tries to lodge his claim is binding on all other creditors. And that is, as we have discussed, is a problem because the other creditors have not consented to the binding effect of the arbitral award, and there's no statute um, the creditors are bound by. Still, the question is um, whether that is such a major difference that the matter should be regarded as non-arbitrable. In its essence, it's still a dispute between the liquidator and the creditor only, and these two parties are parties to the post-petition agreement, and in my view, I would say that this could be uh, considered as arbitrable. Uh, we talked about this in the uh, coffee break, and um, it might be a solution to say that the liquidator, once he disputes the claim that has been lodged, um, he acts as a trustee for the general body of creditors, so... Um, and that might explain why we can still say that the other creditors are bound by the arbitral award on the ranking and validity of the claim. But um, as we know, it's, it's quite a difficult question. Now, at the end of my presentation, let me address a few more special aspects. And the first is one we have hardly discussed today. And that's the recent development of insolvency law. Modern insolvency law encompasses preventive restructuring proceedings or pre-insolvency procedures. In particular, in Europe, following the Directive on Preventive Restructuring Frameworks of 2019. Now, the key feature of these proceedings is that they are semi-collective, not necessarily um, having all the creditors on board, and <coughs> data-driven. The, there's no administrator. There might be a practitioner appointed as a supervisor, but uh, there's no real administrator. There's no stay on legal proceedings, um, and generally speaking, the debtor enjoys full power to conclude new agreements even after entering into such a proceeding, subject to some liability issues and subject to some safeguards that the national law might entail. Likewise, the special <coughs> questions concerning the binding effect of pre-petition agreements might not be as relevant here because court proceedings go on without a suspension or stay. Okay, that's preventive restructuring. A second special aspect I would like to add is the question, or that uh, is that the question may arise, what happens to a post-petition agreement entered into by the administrator after the proceeding has been terminated? Is that still binding on the, uh, on the debtor? And this question may occur in restructuring scenarios where the debtor survives the proceeding. So we are talking about post-proceeding arbitration. First of all, I would say um, the binding effect is a question of the governing insolvency law. That's my perspective, at least. Um, in Germany, as agreeing to the arbitration clause by the administrator is based on his powers relating to the estate, it seems to be pretty straightforward that the debtor is bound by the agreement, even in uh, the situation post-proceeding. Uh, um, even more so, there may be post-proceeding arbitrations concerning the question as to whether a claim 
has been amended in the course of the insolvency proceeding. Um, whether a claim falls under a discharge, for instance, ordered by the insolvency court. And the question of arbitrability in this respect has been debated in US courts, and it has been said that the question uh, is indeed arbitrable. Uh, and that seems to be the right solution, at least to me, because in sub substance, it's simply a dispute on the prior alteration of the claim and, and the value uh, of the claim. Um, to be sure, where the company survives, but the completed restructuring involves a substantial or material transfer of assets to a third party, for instance, the, the, an asset deal, a transfer of assets to a new co, uh, new, newly founded uh, company, um, the utility of commencing arbitral um, proceedings might, of course, be um, oh, sorry, might, of course, be limited since the company will have few assets left after this asset deal, uh, so that might affect the enforceability of the arbitral award. Um, but still, arbitration would, would, of course, be possible. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Christoph. To you, yeah. Thank you very much for that very insightful presentation. And uh, when you said uh, at the beginning, when you started working on that, you thought it's boring. I was shocked already. Yeah? But uh, you made a very interesting topic out of that. Are there any questions from the audience or from the virtual audience? There's one over there. Um. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, uh, you were talking about um, lawsuits or arbitration concerning uh, questions on rank or the validity of a claim. Um, under German insolvency law, um, every uh, creditor is granted the right to object um, a, a claim um, that is brought for the insolvency table. So how would you make sure that... Um, uh, another creditor is able to, to take part in that uh, arbitration proceedings then? Yeah, uh, that, that's fully correct that in German insolvency law, not only the liquidator or administrator may object to the claim, but also every single uh, creditor. But wouldn't that be an argument to, uh, f f in, in favor of arbitrability of such verification claims? Because if only the liquidator objects to the claim, then he more or less acts as a trustee for the general body of creditors. But every single creditor has the right to object, and, and in that, that situation, of course, um, we would uh, have to fight this objection, and then it's a matter of whether the single creditor that objected is bound by an arbitration agreement. So that might be a different different story, but as long as only the liquidator um, objects to the claim, then it's a question of whether the liquidator is bound by the arbitration agreement. And of course, we have that problem with the binding effect on the other creditors that did not take part in that proceeding. But I would say that the possibility of objection that is open to every each uh, single creditor might even be an argument in favor of arbitrability of such uh, verification claims. Um, that's at least my provisional <laughs> opinion on that. Any other questions? Manuel? Thank you. Uh, just related actually to the topic that we were discussing now, so, but what is it that we are doing in the arbitration in that case? In that case, the arbitrators need to identify whether the claim uh, exists and the amount of the claim. But the, credit, the, the arbitrators would not be providing the ranking or the admissibility of that claim within the insolvency process. It, it, is that correct? Because that is then what you obtain when you take the award to the insolvency proceedings and then it is within those proceedings? Um, well, not necessarily. Know, not necessarily, because well, the general um, idea under German law is that 
the, the, the creator files his claim and tries to, to make a registration of the claim. And then usually the liquidator disputes or objects to the, to the claim. And then it's all left to state courts to decide either on the validity of the claim or the ranking. Uh, so if you say that this can be done not only by state courts but also by arbitration or arbitral um, tribunals, then it would be um, the right solution to say that even in that case, the arbitral um, tribunal may decide on the ranking of the claim because that's the full equivalent to the state court proceeding then. Uh, would it make sense to distinguish conceptually that one stage would be the, the identification of the existence and amount of the claim and that can be left for the arbitrators and then the actual ranking within the insolvency, the, the, the list of creditors, that's something that belongs with the insolvency court exclusively or the administrator exclusively? I'm just asking whether that works in... Mm, well, it's probably a bit different in, in German law because, once again, um, if the, the creditor files his claim and he says, for instance, my um, claim is ranked in group one or group two or whatever, um, and then the liquidator says, oh, no, it's uh, group four or five or whatever, right? Uh, so in that case, he would have to object to the claim and to the registration of the claim. Um, and then what follows is a, a court proceeding. So, and the court has to decide then on the ranking of the claim. It's not, not, up, not up to the administrator to uh, say uh, what the proper ranking is. He can have his opinion, but after all, you can still go, go to court and the, it's up to the court then to, de, to make a final decision on the ranking of the claim. Right. Yeah. So we, we, we more or less see ranking um, is just the same as, as the validity of the claim. It's sort of a substantive matter of the claim. And, 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 and indeed, th thank you, Reinhardt, um, we don't have that competence of the insolvency court to, to, to decide on the claim. There's another question here from a colleague from outside, and the question is, when you spoke about the funding aspect of post-petition arbitration, except for legal aid, how viable would be third-party funding, and how the trustee can deal with the third-party funder's fee, keeping in mind the mandatory priority? Um, well, I would say that um, that is sort of a general matter of insolvency law, and that also applies to state court proceedings. And generally speaking, the administrator may, um, may have third-party funding, uh, subject, of course, to his general duty of care. And um, I, I wouldn't see that many problems, because the, the administrator can enter into a contract, he can buy goods, uh, he can do whatever he wants to, at least as, it, as long as it serves the interests of the creditors. And if it's in the interest of the creditors to have the arbitration uh, proceeding, and if that requires third-party funding, uh, and of course doesn't come for free, um, then the liquidator may, may, or the administrator may, may do so. So I don't, I don't see any fundamental problems uh, with third-party funding in that respect. Yeah. There's a further question over there. Well, thank you very much for a very insightful uh, presentation. Um, well, actually, my question was related to one of the final um, aspects that you touched upon about the preventive uh, restructuring proceedings. Um, so I was actually wondering, so you, um, you mentioned as far as I understood that arbitration can just proceed during these preventive uh, restructuring proceedings. But what about the situation where these kind of proceedings then lead later on to an actual liquidation so that they are followed by liquidation? So what would then happen to the arbitration proceedings within these preventive restructuring um, situations? And um, especially when they deal with matters that are then um, solely the responsibility of the insolvency administrator later on. Okay. Well, um, 
I, I cannot speak for all uh, jurisdictions, and of course there might be differences in, in the respective um, national laws, but um, I would say it, it's, it's two, two different things. Uh, you have, first have the preventive restructuring proceeding, and if that fails, then you, you are, this proceeding is being terminated, and then you have to enter into a formal insolvency procedure. And in, in that formal insolvency proceeding, the general rules apply, and one of these rules would be that uh, we have a stay on legal proceedings, um, uh, on le at least on, on legal state court proceedings. And then it's a different matter whether that also affects uh, arbitration proceedings, and, and that is what Reinhardt was saying earlier today, that um, that does not necessarily apply to uh, arbitration proceedings, but we more or less have the same kind of situation because the uh, administrator needs to be given time to um, think about the case once um, we have the opening of uh, the insolvency proceeding. Okay, I think there is no further question, and then we are also in time. Thank you very much again for your presentation, and I invite the next panel on stage. Thanks for that. And I'd like to invite to a quick message for you, Mr. Elias Mubarak from Mediarb. Please, Mr. Elias. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elias Mubarak. I am it's the CEO of the Mediarb RB, and I am very happy to be here in Hamburgo at Buserius Law School, taking part in such an important conference about two key fields in law, arbitration and insolvation. My thanks to Professor Dr. Stefan Kroll for organizing this event together with Professor Reinhard Bork and Professor Dr. Francisco Satiro. I also would like to greet in Professor José Ângelo Estrela Faria, Barbara Gadig, and the audience here in person and online. I would like to take this opportunity to briefly tell you what brings MediArb IB to Hamburgo and this event. But first, let me start by giving you some background information. In Brazil, we have more than 75 million lawsuits, which means that the judicial system costs anywhere over then 100 billion of reais, according to the National Court of Just Reports. As such, the platform and chambers of alternative dispute resolution play a very important role in the scenario in Brazil. MediRB is specialized in corporate restructuring issues, mainly in insolvent proceedings. We have a body of specialists in mediation, arbitration, and the other methods of conflict resolution for corporation. We are the first platform specialized in insolvency and corporate restructuring in Brazil. Our objective is to be a legal think tank to run seminars, congresses, courses, and workshops to promote corpor corporate mediation, and insolvency arbitration. We truly believe that this can improve solution with particular focus on motivation parties to use EDR. And the superior courts have responded to our cry for cooperation. Last week, the presidents of the two major courts in Brazil Supreme Federal Courts and Superior Courts of Justice 
your presence is a recent event in Sao Paulo to launch MedR by B program to improve EDRs in Brazil. We are also working on a partnership with the Dispute Resolution Board Foundation to promote dispute boards, another important method of conflict resolution. DRBF is the leading no-profit organization dedicated to promotion resolution of disputes using dispute boards methods. Our efforts are to make the use of the judicial system more efficient and sustainable, achieving on the goals of the United Nations, just and effective institutions. And we really believe that ADR is the way to reach this goal. I thank you once again. Well, now let's go. We're going for two last panelists. And I'm very pleased to call here uh, Mr. José Ángel Estrela Faria. He's a senior legal officer at the UNCITRAL Secretariat, International Trade Law Division, Office of Legal Affairs. He has held numerous positions at the United Nations. And he was also Secretary, Secretary General of the International Institute for Unification of Private Law, UNIDROI, from October 2008 to July 2017. Before joining the United Nations, Mr. Estrela Faria was an attorney in private practice in Brazil and specialized in commercial and trade law matters, banking and trade contracts and instruments, mergers, insolvency and bankruptcy proceedings. Mr. Estrela Faria holds a law degree, 1985, from a federal university at Rio Grande do Sul, Porto Alegre, Brazil, and a master's on European law, 1989, from Europa Institut der Universitat de San Landes. He has published articles and books on international trade law and economic integration, participated as a speaker at various international conferences and commercial law matters. Our pleasure to have you here, Mr. Estrela Faria. Please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to begin by thanking the organizers, University of Buserius, Professor Krull, University of Hamburg, Professor Borg, uh, University of Sao Paulo, Professor Satiro, for the invitation to be here with you discussing a topic that is very much also being debated within uh, UNCETRAL, although not necessarily always from exactly the same perspective. Um, you will be familiar with this, the emblem of the UN. You have this, this beautiful laurel leaves that embrace the world in a peaceful fashion. Those of you who know Vienna would see it from every single building that city a different symbol. You have this double-headed uh, eagle where each head is looking to a different direction. And in a way, the way our work on arbitration and in software has evolved is somehow reflective more of this approach than of that approach. Perhaps one day it will even get to this one. We'll see how things uh, move forward. So um, the uh, first part I would like to briefly ad to address the way uh, arbitration and insolvency are dealt with in uh, existing UNCITRAL, uh, existing UNCITRAL uh, texts. Uh, and then to uh, present to you very briefly uh, what are the emerging trends on this. But, um, uh, and then to attempt to draw a few conclusions from that. But let us bring us back in time five years ago. We held the Congress celebrating the 50th annual session of uh, UNCITRAL. And at that Congress in 2017, the uh, International Insolvency Institute, the Triple I, presented a proposal for future work by UNCITRAL exactly in the area of arbitration and insolvency. Uh, and the proposal was first to start with a study on the impact of a pending arbitration 
uh, on a penny arbitration resolves the proceedings, something we have heard a lot about today. And then to move to uh, possible uh, areas in which also in, uh, arbitration might make further sense uh, within insolvency to uh, consider exactly the issue of prepetition ag agreements we've heard about before, but also the possible scope of uh, post-petition agreements. And uh, as was suggested here to examine uh, later on the, the use of arbitration proceedings, uh, uh, the international arbitration, international insolvency proceedings in the light of recent experience such as the, the, the Nortel case and others. This is back in uh, 2017. Uh, our agenda is chronically backlogged with many projects, so this is an, was put on the pipeline, is on the pipeline. We have neither the working group on arbitration nor the working group on the service law has yet had the opportunity to reach uh, this point. I must say that both working groups also have looked at this from different perspectives, as we see in a moment why, but maybe and that might be why be a conclusion of today's, uh, of today's discussion, that there is still scope for this, and I think the discussion today proves very much that this is, this is a, 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 a future-looking proposal. But let's look at um, how arbitration, uh, or the points of connection between the existing text and arbitration. And I said that our work has developed like the Austrian-Hungarian uh, double-headed uh, uh, ego is because they barely mention each other, our instruments. Our instruments on arbitration don't mention insolvency, and our instruments on insolvency started expressly mentioning arbitration in a way other than stay in a very recent, uh, in a very, uh, recent uh, case. What does the New York Convention, and, and also it's important to bear in mind that our, we, our suits of instruments in both eras of the law begin with the international instruments dealing with international situations and then down to uh, legislative advice for the domestic context purely. The first of, the first of all of them obviously is even precedes UNCITRAW itself is the New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of uh, Foreign Arbitral Awards. The convention uh, deals with it, as you know, in two, in two ways. There is first the obligation to recognize the arbitration agreement and such, and then there are the, the provisions related to the enforcement of the award. They are not exactly drafted ex with the same language. There are some differences that also may uh, have some impact in the to topic we're discussing. But basically, under Article 2, a court has to recognize an arbitration agreement. The question is, if there is a foreign arbitration agreement, is it binding on an insolvency court? The New York Convention that doesn't say anything. It's left for the domestic law to uh, d determine whether an arbitration agreement would perhaps be no void or inoperative or incapable of being performed or be in violation of public policy of that country, in which case the arbitration agreement as such would not be uh, enforced. Now, when it comes to the award itself later on, and uh, uh, this perhaps is the area that would uh, brings the uh, most potential for possible conflict uh, is the recognition stage, and, and uh, I would like to discuss that in a moment. But there we have basically two possibilities for not in for, for set for a setting outside the war, either because it's not capable of settlement or arbitration, it's not an arbitrable matter, or because it violates the public policy of the country of enforcement. We have basically the same structure reproduced in the model law on arbitration for a purely domestic context. Now, um, I will not, uh, I will not, not at this moment, do I want to the, uh, the arbitration uh, details of this because you're all familiar with them. But our understanding has been so far, and the practical application of this has been so far, that there is, as we saw today, divergence in the, and, and Professor Bork also stressed that divergence in the treatment of arbitrability under domestic law, still countries that have a very uh, negative attitude towards arbitration, consider that, broadly speaking, nearly nothing is arbitrable to those that are more lenient as Germany, as you know, and this is uh, part of the guide on the Convention on, on Recognition Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards that refers to jurisprudence both in France 
in uh, Germany to illustrate this opposition. Anzitrau has not attempted to harmonize arbitrability. As a matter of fact, this was, so both the New York Convention and the Model Law are silent on this. They refer to a concept which is then developed under the domestic laws, and there has been big resistance by states so far to try to harmonize arbitrability, or even to draw up a catalog of non-arbitral matters. The last time that this was uh, discussed, it was when Ansutra was shaping up the long-term uh, uh, work program for, the, for arbitration, in the area of arbitration. It was still uh, under the uh, leadership of a former secretary, secretary of Ansutra, Gerhard Hermann, and was then did an extensive study in the late 90s. And last time the commission considered arbitrability was in 1999, and the reaction was very negative. The basic is saying, uh, this is constant to subject development. It's, it may be not prudent to try to harmonize. There are too many differences in public policy. Let's stay away from this. So none of the work on arbitrations afterwards has attempted to provide parameters for ar arbitrability in the form either, not even of a guidance instrument. That's where we're coming from in the era of arbitration, the work uh, focus on arbitration. Now, um, the problems that uh, we have come mainly uh, than at the enforcement stage, given the, the mandatory nature of the provision of the New York Convention. Neither the New York Convention nor the model law contemplate a, proce a procedure for staying arbitral proceedings. It's the other way around. All, the, only, the only thing that they contemplate is the staying of court proceedings when there is an arbitration agreement and the obligation by, by the court to refer the parties to arbitration. But that's doesn't deal with the question of the powers of the insolvency court to try to suspend a, a pending arbitration or prevent a future arbitration from uh, taking uh, place. The problem that the, we see from uh, uh, the uh, from arbitration within this context, under this general international umbrella in the insolvency context is that we, there is a risk of parallel uh, proceedings that will be undesirable in an insolvency context. And I, uh, those who f uh, particularly favor arbitration in insolvency context should not, get, should not be worried about what I'm saying at this stage because there's also a second half of what I'm saying. I mean, this, I'm only the diagnosed uh, phase of this. And, this is a difficulty, and I'll give one example. Um, we all know it from the latest since the Hill Martin case that the setting aside of an arbitral award in the seat of arbitration does not preclude the enforcement of the same award in a different jurisdiction. So we may have an arbitration case then involving an insolvency, an insolvent company that proceeds despite the insolvency proceeding, either because the court was not capable of stopping those proceedings or because they are taking place in a country different from the country of the insolvency proceeding. And the, that creditor trying to uh, enforce that award in a third jurisdiction where the debtor has assets. And neither the New York Convention nor uh, any other of the existing instruments at this stage would prevent that, would stop that situation. So we recognize that this is, this is a problematic area uh, for which one would like, ideally should try to develop a solution. Um, both uh, limitations on arbitrability and public policy concerns may also be invoked to prevent uh, the recognition of a post-insolvency arbitration agreement or the enforcement of the award, depending on the competent jurisdiction. Um, now, how then do the insolvency instruments of UNCTRA look at arbitration? 
And here we have a series of other instruments uh, coming from the beginning with the model on cross border. So as I said, in both areas, the starting point is always international, and then we move down to the uh, domestic uh, context. And here, that is followed by uh, the legislative guide on insolvency, and then in two other model laws, one is the recognition of judgments, and the second one on uh, an enterprise group insolvency. Here, and um, I don't need to explain the model law in detail, but it's only important to bear in mind that the model law, like the uh, EU regulation, deals with main and non-main proceedings. Uh, the definition of, may, of uh, main proceedings based on the center of uh, uh, center of interest of the, or commi of the insolvent uh, company, center of main interest, is roughly similar. There is, however, one important distinction between the two of them is that under the Ancetral model on cross-border insolvency, it is, is this possible under Article 28 to open local insol insolvency proceedings in case where the debtor has only assets in a jurisdiction, not only an establishment. Now, this makes for countries that have implemented the model law the situation of the non-enforce or, say, of the attempted enforcement of an award annulled in the country of, of, of origin even more problematic because it might even entice and encourage the opening of more parallel insolvency proceedings in every jurisdiction where the debtor has assets in an attempt to prevent, for instance, a creditor who was successful in, uh, in an arbitration proceeding from seizing local assets in those jurisdictions. So it's also an area of a problem that would call for a solution that tries to find a harmony between, uh, uh, a harmonious solution between the two situations. Now, more concretely on, on, on insolvency and arbitration, the model law also contemplates the possibility of two types of stay. One is by, in, by in, as interim relief, and then a stay that is uh, the, the, uh, the uh, pro, uh, pronounced automatically as an, an automatic effect of recognition of a foreign proceeding under Article 20. And Article 20 simply refers to, to um, the stay of individual actions and then also of enforcement actions. It doesn't specify which individual actions. However, the, it was the understanding of the, of the working group, as also stated in also all the explanatory material <laughs> uh, developed by Ancetral to it, that it covers also arbitral awards. Now, that means that the philosophy of the model law, and here you see the, 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 two, uh, the, the, the two heads looking in different directions. You have the universality principle under the arbitration instruments. You also have here the modified universalism of the model law on insolvency that uh, contemplates that this state would apply everywhere. This is the philosophy of the model law on insolvency, that once an, uh, uh, an insolvency proceeding is, 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 is uh, open and declared somewhere, that should have effects everywhere where the assets has its um, has establishments or, or, or assets, and that in the interest of the best possible administration of the foreign main proceeding. However, recognizing, and then also as you see quoting in the uh, the guide to the of the model law on cross-border insolvency, that in practical terms, it may be very difficult for a court to implement that state, especially in a foreign jurisdiction. Um, it's also not entirely clear how a court would implement that state uh, against the plain text of the New York Convention, in case someone would try to enforce an arbitration agreement under the New York Convention, despite the local insolvency procedure, unless the court is able to demonstrate that that violates public policy, which is also not universally uh, acknowledged. So another point that one uh, would require some further uh, study in the future. The stay in its form of applying also to insolvency proceedings was also contemplated in the same way under the legislative guide as a recommendation for domestic law. So countries that adopt the ancestral model law, or sorry, the legislative guide uh, 
to develop legislation based on the legislative guide domestically would then are also invited to uh, treat this day that way as extending also to arbitration proceedings. The model on recognition of judgments applies only strictly to judgments and judgments defined as issued by a court administrative authority. So they would not apply, the, that model law does not apply to any form or ar uh, foreign arbitral uh, award that is issued in conjunction with an insolvency proceeding. Now, there has been some, recently some movement in this area, and uh, this is where I would, um, as I move towards my uh, conclusions, I would also like to, uh, to stress to you. And that is uh, begin with the model law on enterprise group insolvency. The model law on enterprise group insolvency also was, was developed in the light of the experience with large uh, enterprise group insolvencies, Nortel, uh, and, and others, and is aimed at promoting the best possible cooperation among all the insolvency representatives in the case of, an, uh, of, of a group insolvency uh, and uh, so, so as to facilitate planning proceedings and developing a group solutions. And this model law encourages mediation and arbitration. So it basically encourages the courts that oversee those individual uh, uh, insolvency proceedings to uh, uh, authorize the uh, insolvency representatives to use means that ensure the, max, the cooperation to the maximum extent possible, including by the use of mediation or, and but here this important caveat, with the consent of the parties, and discuss that today. So it is not implied here that you can have a cram down uh, of uh, insolvency of arbitration agreements on all uh, uh, parties involved to resolve dispute between enterprise group members concerning their uh, mutual claims. So this is an important also step, uh, uh, a positive step towards uh, integrating actively uh, arbitration in insolvency proceedings in UNCITRAL uh, text. However, when it comes to relief, even in this context, all, this text also has remained faithful to the uh, entire ancestral tradition on, on insolvency and says the stay applies equally to the stay of insolvency proceedings. Uh, so it covers all individual actions and individual proceedings. Uh, and the commentary is drafted pretty much in the same terms as the commentary to all the other texts. So the work on insolvency has been one that has now reached the point of more openness stores it, but when it comes to stay, still, uh, still maintains the same, the same position. So I would now like to then take stock at where are you with this. So the model on cross-border insolvency and religious life do not express the exclude arbitration. That's also important to point out. They don't say, thou shall not arbitrate. They simply say, if you do, fine, but it's always stayed like any other actions. You cannot proceed with the arbitration during the duration of the ordinary stay. Um, there was no specific discussion of arbitrability so far in the work of uh, UNCITRAL. And I say so far, and I will explain in a moment why so far, because I think that this discussion will come, and the presentation that follows mine by uh, Stefan Kröhler would probably also provide you with enough uh, indication of why it should uh, take place in the context of discussion of applicable law in insolvency proceedings that is, 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 has started at uh, UNCITRAL. So there has been no discussion of arbitrability in insolvency proceedings, but uh, the UNCITRAL legislative guide contains uh, recommendations concerning applicable law in insolvency proceedings. And perhaps what we currently have as the catalog of, so to speak, the legislative vis attractiva of the insolvency law, that is, the things that are normally subject or should normally be subject to the law of the state of insolvency proceedings, could provide a basis for delineating the boundaries of arbitrability in insolvency law and would seem to be very much in line with what things that have been discussed today. So, 
that the management of the insolvency proceeding would naturally not be a candidate for that, but the rights and obligations of the parties within some boundaries are a very a good candidate for uh, also being uh, capable of being settled by arbitration, uh, in, including insolvency proceedings. Where are, however, the uh, lim possible limits and something that will also do we deserve fur further discussion and consideration? And also the first point is uh, and also, as uh, Stefan was uh, citing at the, the beginning, a, 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 a judgment of the second uh, federal court of this, for the Second Circuit of the United States of 1999, that by itself cites an earlier case of Massachusetts of 87, basically saying you are talking about two polarly opposed situations, one with concentration of claims and one that allows uh, 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 the, the parallel uh, distribution of claims and adjudication of claims. And the question is how to ensure that a system that was not meant for uh, either creating precedent nor for being binding on another case involving even the same parties can uh, be inspired by some uh, level of consistent predictability that is a, a basic tenor of the running of, of insolvency proceedings. The second is how one deals with some elements of insolvency law which may not necessarily be public policy, strictly speaking, and certainly not international public policy, but may be mandatory or in some countries even public policy. How to deal with an arbitral award that contains an award in interest or damage that includes penalty clauses, how and, 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 and other as elements which in some legal systems might be contrary to public policy. Bear in mind that the standards of control of the content of the arbitral war are those set by the New York Convention, and they are pretty strict. It is, it is public policy stricto sensu. It's not just uh, a, a misapplication of the applicable law by the arbitral tribunal, because the court, the state courts have no power to do that. So they have to take the award as such. Is the solution to expurge elements of that award, but also that one has to consider on what basis that is done if the award is an international award that is protected by the New York Convention. Another question is um, then equal treatment of creditors in questions where um, are not maybe not involved in public policy, but where it would be simply a question of ensuring a coherent treatment of claims in an insolvency proceedings to avoid uh, detrimental or uh, favorable treatment of one creditor or a detrimental treatment of the other creditor. Think of just the, the current pandemic. And if companies go in insolvent because they're unable to perform their contracts and they would like to, uh, they, invo they invoke a force majeure defense for their contracts. And it would be in the interest of the administration of the insolvency state, also, also of the insolvency court, that that argument is adjudicated in a predictable and consistent and uniform fashion across all claims. It's very difficult to ensure that to, uh, merely through, uh, in, in, in parallel arbitration proceedings. And once the court had receives that uh, an award, would even would be even less possible for the court to to extract that from the award because that would imply re-examine the merits the merits of the claim by the arbitral tribunal, which the court is not authorized to do. And certainly, the misapplication of the law of force majeure is not a violation of public policy in any country. So it's it's a it's it's a it, it's a delicate thing that would require some thinking. I would uh, skip this to come to my conclusions. And they are the relationship between, between these two areas remains complex, but the law has evolved considerably. And even the, uh, the, in the work of ancestral own insolvency law, and this has been mainly due to experience with cross border cases and enterprise group insolvencies, that the current consideration at UNCETRAL of two projects on asset tracing recovery, but in particular of applicable law in insolvency proceedings, 
may offer an opportunity to look again at the question of the use of arbitration and insolvency and trying to clarify the law in this area. And also to take up that proposal of the IIII of 2017 and uh, perhaps for UNCITRAL to develop guidance on the effect, efficient cooperation between insolvency courts and arbitration, perhaps in you know, the possibility of some, some sort of protocol or frame within which the courts could best make use of, uh, of, of arbitration for the purpose of determining uh, the rights and obligations of the parties and making other factual determinations within the boundaries of what would be eventually not only enforceable in the country, but also what be, would be acceptable from a substantive insolvency law point of view. So that is what I wanted to, to share with you. And uh, if uh, this picture sounds uh, at the end brighter and less gloomy than it sounded at the beginning, I will be already happy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor José Angelo, for a great, great speech. And now I'm oh, <laughs> and now I'm very pleased uh, to announce Professor Dr. Stefan Kroll. He is a professor for international dispute resolution and director of the Center for International Business Resolution at Buceros Law School. Since 2022, he serves as a chairman of the board of the Deutsche Institution für Schiedsgerichtsbarkeit. Wow, this is crew. <laughs> Sorry for the pronunciation. Hope it was at least close. This, much easier. In addition, he is a visiting professor at the School of International Arbitration at CCLS. Queen Mary University of London, and has acted as an advisor and consultant for the relevant organization of the German government and U.S. aid in various countries. Since 2012, Stefan Crow is one of the directors of the Villain Civis Arbitration Moot Court, the famous, the world famous Vismut. Uh, the leading student competition in the fields of international commercial law and arbitration with more than 350 participating universities. Ancitral has retained him, him as one of the three experts to prepare the digest on the model law and international commercial arbitration. So, Professor Stefan Crow, please, the room is yours. So thank you very much, uh, Francisco, for that in, in nice introduction and the good pronunciation of the German Arbitration Institute. Uh, I stay with the English version of that. Um, I'm talking at the end of the conference, which is the most favorable slot for everybody. I'm talking about a topic, arbitration and foreign insolvency proceedings, conflict of law questions, which in itself would probably already merit an entire in entire lecture. And when you have a look at that, the issues of conflict of laws and arbitration already are sufficient for an entire lecture at the Hague Academy by George Berman. And now there comes a little bit of uh, unashamed self-marketing. Also, we published a book on conflict of laws and arbitration. Nevertheless, until uh, Angelo and his colleagues at Ancetral managed to arrive at making the double eagle, uh, the double-headed eagle, looking at the same side, yeah, same direction, uh, probably conflict of war will remain a very difficult topic, in particular at the intersection of arbitration and insolvency proceedings. So don't expect any definite answers. What I try to do is to basically outline the map of the existing problems and the first solutions which have been suggested in by courts and also by scholars. When we look at 
at the cases arbitration and solvency, we already heard uh, from the Larson Oil Petrobras Singapore Court of Appeal decision, which again mapped out on the local domestic side that they have two basically completely opposing areas of law. One embodying party autonomy and decentralization of uh, private dispute resolution, on the other one, collective statutory solution of disputes. That doesn't only apply to the purely domestic side, but that also has a considerable bearing on international cases. And again, to take up one of the cases we have already mentioned, the Riverrock case. In the Riverrock case, we had Riverrock, which entered into a loan agreement with uh, RV, a Cyprus uh, bank. That loan agreement was then later on sold to UBS. UBS turned the loan agreement into notes which were then sold to Riverrock, and Riverrock sold them to a bank in St. Petersburg. And the notes provided for English law and LCAA arbitration in London. The bank in St. Petersburg was declared bankrupt. There were investigations into the uh, transactions, and uh, one of the issues was that RV, one of the biggest shareholders in basically the International Bank of St. Petersburg, used this whole transaction to siphon away assets of the bank to Riverrock uh, and UBS. And the started an action in the arbitrage court that has nothing to do with arbitration, but it's a standard commercial court in Russia, and asking for invalidation. And as I said, the notes provided for arbitration in London under LCA rules, and what Riverrock did, they started anti-suit and an anti-suit injunction, brought an anti-suit injunction in the uh, courts in the UK and asking for stopping the proceedings in, in, the, uh, in Russia. And so we had here the conflict on the one hand with the uh, Russian insolvency law providing for uh, largely uh, annulment in validation actions and also providing that these actions could only be heard in the courts, while we had maybe the English arbitration law providing for anti suit injunction that these disputes could be heard by an arbitral tribunal. So why do I mention that case? Because what is interesting in the case, there is a reference to a statement by one of the, um, the counsel, and the counsel said that we have two conflicting English public policies. One is upholding arbitration agreement. The other one is uh, that avoidance claims, non, um, avoidance claims in insolvency proceedings are non-arbitrable. And the, the um, counsel tried to argue that this conflicting principle should be balanced in a domestic setting the same way they should be balanced in an international setting, arguing that we also have a third public policy that we give um, uh, we give effect to foreign insolvency proceedings. But the interesting part is that the judge said, at some level, I agree that there is such a public policy, but the content is, in my view, nowhere near as expensive as the submission of the counsel. So in the decision, the judge in principle said, yeah, maybe things we, when we balance them in the national arena, it may be di balanced differently in the international arena. Yeah. So... Why is that so? We looked at the uh, in different insolvency laws. They have largely same purposes and features. We mentioned already some of them. I'm not going into greater detail here in interest of time. And then we look at the restrictions imposed by the various insolvency laws on actual proceedings. And the first restriction, most insolvency laws, and which you also find in the answer trial work, is there's a limitation on the debtor's right to manage the estate and a transfer of that um, right to the insolvency administrator or the insolvency practitioner. Um, the second restriction you find, you very often have provisions to ensure the equality of creditors and the orderly distribution of assets. You have a prohibition that you have individual actions. You have a centralization of issues in a single court. And you have to register everything, all your claims with, it, with that authority. The next one we find frequently, there are special powers to the insolvency administrator to maximize the value of the estate. Uh, you have avoidance right or avoidance rights for the transaction within a given suspicious period. 
and you have the right to terminate, execute your current contract, however you call them, which haven't been performed entirely and where the insolvency administrator thinks that it would be better for the estate not to be forced to enforce uh, that contract. Sorry, how do I go back? The problem is, when you look at that, how does insolvency interact with arbitration, and how, when you look at the various approaches in the various jurisdictions, you have many laws which have no specific rule on the relationship between insolvency and arbitration. That means, if there's no specific regulation, you have to rely on the general regulation. And as uh, Anjo said on the international level, the same applies on the national level. Very often you have them looking at completely different directions and no guidance on how they interact. Second, you have very often broad and undefined concept. We discussed, for example, the concept of executory, con uh, executory contracts or the nature of the arbitration agreement, which always give rise to discussions and where you can have conflicts there. And also another concept which is not completely defined is what are core proceedings in an arbitration. When you look at core proceedings as defined in the United States, they are completely different than core proceedings defined in Germany, uh, if we use that wording at all. Next point, very often you have discretion by the courts, where we have, for example, in the United States, you have an automatic stay, but then it's the discretion of the court whether they want to lift the stay. And last but not least, you have naturally also considerable tactical behavior by the parties, which leads to these type of problems. So the anti-suit injunction there, or perhaps the action in, in Russia, and you have a lot of these corporate insolvencies where you ask yourself, is it really an insolvency, or is it more trying to get rid of some of the non-favorable contracts? So what is the solution adopted by those jurisdictions which have found a rule on that? On the one extreme, you have the already mentioned Latvian arbitration law. And there the court, uh, the Latvian arbitration law, section 5, clearly says arbitration is in principle possible except for the following disputes. And then article number 8 mentions the rights and obligation of persons who have entered into insolvency proceedings. So here we have an exclusion of arbitrability. Then you have other provisions. We have a provision of Polish bankruptcy law, an old provision of Polish bankruptcy law, which played a role in one of the dis cases I'm coming to in a moment, uh, where they say the, in an arbitration clause concluded by the bankrupt shall lose its legal effect at the date of bankrupt, at the date bankruptcy is declared, and any pending arbitration proceedings shall be discontinued. That has been amended to show perhaps a little bit the development uh, Angelo was describing on the international level, uh, also at the national level here. Now the new version says, if at the day of the declaration of bankruptcy and arbitration proceedings have not been initiated, the liquidator may withdraw. So we make a distinction between arbitration proceedings which are already pending and those which haven't been uh, initiated. And for those which have been initiated, the Polish position is no longer the one they had before. And then we have the English law, where, which deals with a particular issue where it says if a trustee in bankrupt adopts the contract, dealing again with the executory contracts, the arbitration agreement is enforceable by against the trustee. If they do not adopt the contract, then the other party may apply to the court and the, may ask for an order that the matter be referred to arbitration. So we have here court discretion. And then you have a number of other jurisdictions. You see that I also went to Latin America, but not, did not look at the Brazilian ones. I left that to you. We have in Peru, we have in Chile, we have in Uruguay certain laws, and they all come to a slightly different conclusion. That leads to the problem that we have different laws which start from largely broad, broadly the same ideas, but take different, make different conclusions as to how do we restrict arbitration. And those which leave nearly no room to arbitration are the Latvians, yeah, which say all these disputes are non-arbitrable. That means also an insolvency administrator cannot refer them to arbitration anymore, even if they agree on that. Then we have those where they say maybe the company loses the capacity to go to arbitration, but perhaps the insolvency administrator can still uh, 
go to arbitration, make a decision that have, we have, let's say, post-insolvency arbitration agreements or whatsoever. So at least it leaves a little bit, at least, room for arbitration. Then we have those which say the validity of pre-filing arbitration agreement is affected, but not the validity of post-filing arbitration agreement that at least gives clearly the opportunity to go to arbitration, at least if the insolvency administrator concludes such an agreement. And last but not least, we have those which may say, we stay the proceedings for some time. We may have certain amendments to the proceedings that you have to file your claim first with the insolvency administrator. But apart from that, the proceedings, arbitration proceedings can go on. There's just a modification of procedure on the basis of insolvency requirements. So let's look at the possible scenarios which, where the problem can arise. And it can arise everywhere. And we have already seen that the solution may be different depending on when the insolvency arises. It may arise before we conclude an arbitration agreement. Then the question arises, is the insolvency administrator empowered to do so? Second is, there's a pre-filing so pre arbitration agreement, but the insolvency starts before the proceedings. We have seen the Polish provision where they say you cannot go there, or you're not required to go to arbitration as an insolvency administrator, you have the choice what you do. And then we have the one I'm looking now to, that is the most frequent one, we have pending arbitration proceedings, and then one of the parties becomes insolvent. And also there are some proceedings where also after an award has been rendered, then suddenly the party becomes insolvent, and the question is, how can you enforce the award? Are there special proceedings? Do you, how do you file that with the insolvency administrator? But I'm concentrating on the most important scenario of the insolvency proceedings uh, starting after the start of the arbitration. And when we look at the potential conflict scenarios which may arise there, it may arise if the place of insolvency is in one country while the place of arbitration is in a different country. And the respondent is naturally based where the place of insolvency is. And then you have different courts which may deal with that or where the potential issue may arise, and they may come com to completely different conclusion. First of all, it may arise in front of the arbitral tribunal. If one of the parties invokes, I've been declared insolvent, there's no longer a valid arbitration agreement, it challenges the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal, or the same applies if the dispute is non-arbitrable. But it may then also arise in front of the courts at that place, for example, when you ask for an anti-suit injunction, the Riverwreck example, or when you ask for support by the state courts in taking evidence, appointing arbitrators, again then, the party may raise the issue saying you shouldn't appoint the arbitrator because the arbitration agreement is invalid under the law of the place of insolvency. And whenever the law of the place of insolvency is, more, is stricter, gives less leeway to arbitration, then the question arises, Am I looking into my own law, or am I looking to the law of the other state? And naturally, also, the same may arise at the place of insolvency when, for example, when a claim is brought by either the uh, insolvency administrator uh, against the debtor, uh, sorry, against the, one of the creditors or against another party, and the other party invokes the arbitration agreement. And then the insolvency administrator says, no, under my law, this arbitration agreement becomes invalid. And last but not least, there's also another situation. Not only these two jurisdictions will look at that, but also potential other jurisdictions. Angela mentioned one of the big problems there, that this other jurisdiction may be the ones where you want to enforce the award and uh, where the debtor has assets. And if these assets are not covered by the same insolvency law as applies at the place of insolvency, you suddenly have a problem there, which you have somehow to coordinate. And all that arose in this famous Vivendi case. And that is a paradigm case that's a model case of what happens in these, or may happen in these type of cases. And we had a contract uh, where Electrum, a Polish company, sold its shares in the mobile telephone company PTC uh, to Vivendi in France. Unfortunately, they sold it also to some others. And in the end, there was a major dispute uh, because the shares were taken over then by one of the other telecom com companies, and Vivendi brought an action. And they brought an action, a breach of obligation of the, under the contract. The action was for 1.9 billion euros. Um, when they were starting the proceedings in the arbitration proceedings, 
In the middle of the arbitration proceeding, shortly before a hearing, uh, a Polish court declared Electrim bankrupt. And there were rumors that this was just to avoid these proceedings. I'm not an expert on Polish arbitration law, but colleagues told, uh, sorry, Polish insolvency law, but colleagues told me that in Poland, insolvency judges are very unexperienced young judges. That's one of the steps of your early careers, and you have a limited time. And the last thing you want, have a difficult post m a dispute, whatever, of 1.9 billion decided by a young judge, which has two or three days' time to decide with that. So there was a serious interest in them continuing the arbitration. What happened in the case, the tribunal was, the jurisdiction of the tribunal was challenged on the basis of a, that provision, old provision of Polish arbitration law, which I mentioned, which said, an arbitration clause concluded by the bankrupt shall lose its legal effect. There was an interim award rendered by the tribunal, and the tribunal said, we have jurisdiction. It's not the Polish law we are looking to, we are looking to English law, because we are looking here at arbitration questions, and the arbitration questions are governed by the arbitration law. We're looking at the law which governs the arbitration agreement, that is English law, so Polish insolvency law is not interesting for us. That decision was upheld by the Court of Appeal. But we also had a second set of proceedings in Switzerland. And in Switzerland, and I'm probably now talking under supervision of, uh, I don't know, he has been within the law firm at the time who helped make the case in, in, in Switzerland. In Switzerland, the arbitrators came to exactly the opposite conclusion. They said, no, it's not a question of uh, arbitral, the arbitration agreement, but it's a question of the capacity of the party. Capacity of the party capacity is normally governed by the law which governs that particular party. That is Polish law. Polish law says the ab it's invalid. You cannot arbitrate with a bankrupt party because if all arbitration agreement is invalid, that's largely there's a lack of capacity. Um, and again, they rejected they in the award they rejected jurisdiction. And again, the case went up to the state courts, and the state courts also confirmed that award. So we had two awards, opposite awards, which have been confirmed in both by leading jurisdiction, arbitration-related jurisdictions, naturally under different environment. In England at the time, we had the uh, insolvency regulation, the old version of the insolvency regulation. I'm coming to that in a moment. While in Switzerland, we had basically nothing. There was not a proper conflict of law provision for international insolvency law at the time. They had just a rule on secondary insolvency, and also they said the arbitration provisions are not really applicable here in one way or another. So they were really facing a situation being without any major guidance. So the whole case depended on the just question, is Swiss or English law applicable to that question, or is it Polish law? And that is the question you're faced frequently with. The case went on. We had later on, in, so, after the English rendered their decision, uh, they wanted to enforce it in Poland. And everyone thought in Poland never, they will never be able to enforce that. They will clearly be against public policy. To the big surprise of everyone, the Polish court said, no, that's not against public policy. We are the outlier here, and we changed the law shortly thereafter. Uh, so the award was recognized. By contrast, in France, which always sells itself as the place, the home of arbitration, being the most arbitration-friendly jurisdiction in the world, they denied the recognition enforcement of that, Ameri uh, of that English award due to public policy concerns. But how do we arrive at that? What are the conflict questions raised in such a scenario? The first conflict question, which is not really raised any longer in today, but which was raised for a long time, do we recognize foreign insolvency proceedings? It's not like in state proceedings, a special act of recognition, but just do we accept that as a fact that the one party is insolvent and there are certain legal effects associated with that? If we take that, and that is the prevailing view now everywhere, because we have the answer trial uh, model on that, we have uh, also the European regulation where it's always, in principle, we recognize foreign insolvency proceedings. The next question is, what law governs the particular effects we're looking at? It may be the lex fore concursus, that means largely the insolvency law of the place of insolvency. It may be the lex loci arbitri, meaning the arbitration law at the place of arbitration, or it may be another law, 
For example, if the parties have submitted the arbitration agreement to a law of a different state. If we come to a different law, but and not the insolvent law where the party was declared insolvent, the next question which arises, even if we apply that law, are the provisions of the insolvency law maybe mandatory provisions of a third, international mandatory provisions of a third country? But the big question is very often, what are our relevant conflict law rules at all? Where do we look? Do we look to the international insolvency law, or do we look to the various provisions of the arbitration, which exist for arbitration? For courts, it's fairly easy. The courts are bound by their national conflict rules. They are particularly made for the courts. The problem, however, is at some stages, for some of the problems we have, there is no specific conflict of law provision. And that was what happened in the Swiss case, where there was no conflict of law provision dealing with what happens if we have a foreign insolvency, which law is applicable to that. The problems aggravate if we have an arbitral tribunal. The arbitral tribunal is not part of the judiciary and therefore not necessarily bound by the conflict of law provisions of that particular state. We have, in effect, a number of specific rules for arbitration tribunal and also a number of specific conflict of law provisions for the arbitral tribunal. For example, concerning form, concerning arbitrability, these do not exist for state courts. But then the question arises, if we do not have a special conflict of law provision for arbitration tribunals uh, for that particular issue, can I then rely on the conflict of law provisions for state courts, in particular the conflict of law provisions dealing with international insolvency law? And when you ask yourself, are these rules suitable, you look at the underlying rationale of these old rules, and the central objective of the conflict of law provisions for state courts most of the time also apply for arbitration tribunals, but there are additional factors which play hardly a role in the, de, in the uh, creating of conflict of law provisions for state courts, that is party autonomy, you want to have an enforceable issue, and there is very less interest of the state involved. It's a private method of dispute resolution normally that may be different if we talk about insolvency. So these are just the general consideration. And then the next problem arises, how and that is one of the crucial problems already mentioned by Manuel, some of the general theories of conflict of laws. And the central one which are relevant here is characterization. So how do I classify the problem I'm having, or how do I classify the particular provision of domestic insolvency law one of the parties relies on in that international setting? Taking the Swiss example, is that an issue of capacity of a party? That means I'm looking to the conflict of law provision for capacity. Or is it an issue for validity of the arbitration agreement? And then I'm looking at the conflict of law provision for arbitration agreements. And then we had another issue which is mentioned, what mentioned by Vesna, Jura uh, Novit Korea. Can a judge, it's clear that a judge may apply his view of the law. We had the one judge in Canada who said, separability, you're not pleading that, I applied anyway. Uh, but does that apply to arbitrators as well? And then there is often an issue, how do I ascertain the contact of a different law? Uh, Polish arbitration law at the time, there was a translation, but when you look at the different, different cases, they use different translation of that provision. Yeah? So the English translation, the only one I'm able to read, yeah? uh, I cannot look to the real one, but the English translation used in the Swiss proceedings and the English proceedings was different. So, as I said, the courts, it's fairly easy. They have the Lex Foray approach. But the courts also have different type of conflict provisions. We have very often, in, most, in a lot of jurisdictions, for example in Germany, we have special what I call institution-specific conflict rules which are relevant for arbitration. And they very often come from the New York Convention, where it says the arbitration agreement is governed by the law to which the parties have submitted it or the law of the place of arbitration. We have uh, provisions concerning the arbitrability of, any, of a dispute, whatever. But we also have what I call now issue-specific conflict rules, insolvency-specific conflict rules. We have in the German Insolvency Code, we have an entire section on international insolvency law, which is not uh, the ancestral model law. Yeah, but uh, and additionally, we also have within Europe uh, 
the insolvency regulation, which deals with insolvency issues in that. And the problem is, how do they interact? Um, when I look at the enforcement of an award, is international insolvency law playing a role? Probably not, because it's really we're looking at the enforcement of the award. But at the earlier stages, the pre-award stages, am I now, when I'm bringing an action in a German, when the insolvency administrator is bringing an action in a German state court, and the other party wants to invoke the arbitration agreement, we have a conflict. Article 2 New York Convention says you have to refer the parties to arbitration, while maybe the provision of international insolvency law says it's the law of the place of insolvency, and take the Polish example, you're not, referring the place to arbitra uh, you're not referring them to arbitration. There is one provision which looks at the first side as if we have in issue and institution-specific rules, and that is the European Insolvency Regulation, which says normally it's the sta state of the opening of the proceedings which governs most of the important things. In particular, the effect of insolvency proceedings on current contracts to which the debtor is a party. However, there are certain exceptions, and there's one exception now for pending arbitral proceedings, and then it's not the law of the insolvency, pla place of insolvency, but then it's the law of the place of arbitration. And that was largely the predecessor of that, is uh, what the English court applied in the Vivendi case. They applied the predecessor of the European regulation, which at the time was not as specific. They only said court proceedings uh, can continue if they have already, if they're already pending. They have changed that. They have put in pending arbitration proceedings as well. So the situation under that regulation may be that once, some, once it's pending, it may go on, and it's the law of the place of arbitration which is relevant. If it's not already pending, it's the law of the place of insolvency which is relevant, and that place may then, if it's, it was Poland at the time, may determine that the arbitration agreement is invalid and you cannot go to arbitration. The problem is, again, the characterization issue. And in that characterization issue, if I'm going back to the, to the uh, Vivendi case, um, you had a number of different characterizations, how you could characterize this Polish provision. And this Polish provision could be characterized as procedural. It's an issue where they can continue the arbitration proceedings. Then it would be the law of the place of arbitration, either Swiss or English law. Effect would have been the arbitration proceedings can continue. You can also say we characterize that as the law which is relevant or the problem which is, sorry, the provision which is relevant for the uh, validity of the arbitration agreement. And that is governed by the law which governs the arbitration agreement. And in both cases, it would have either been Swiss or English law. Again, the proceedings would have been uh, possible in Switzerland as well. Or, and that was how what the Swiss Supreme Court said, it's a question of capacity. And then the capacity question comes, that is governed by the law where the party comes from, and that was Polish law, and that's how they arrived there. So the question is, how do the characterization work? And you look at the number of steps, this is a standard provision of... Um, of, um, public, of private international law. But the question is, at the downside, is there any arbitration-specific consideration which plays a role in the uh, characterization of the issues? And the arbitration-specific one may be when you look at the various stages of characterization. And normally, you characterize a question, and then you apply the particular law. But there's an English decision which says, the first stage, you may also look at the second stage, what is the outcome. And normally that's a little bit contrary to private international law, which is not looking at the outcome, but it's very technical. But here you may take into account that if you come to a solution which would really affect party autonomy, the basis of arbitration, you should perhaps characterize it differently. So the Swiss court could have characterized it, have looked at it and say, if we characterize it capacity, um, we have the outcome there is no arbitration possible. We are basically denying any effect of the party's agreement to arbitrate. 
uh, maybe we take that into account when we characterize the issue, and when you look at the provision, the Polish provision, at least the, the um, interpretation of that or the translation of that, you could easily say it's not dealing with capacity of the parties, it's dealing with the validity and the effect of the arbitration agreement. So this is just one issue where there may be arbitration-relevant considerations at the characterization issue. And then we have all the issues concerning the applicable law for the arbitral tribunal. And there have been suggestions to have special rules for arbitral tribunals, conflict rules, special conflict rules of arbitral tribunals, which are based, when you devise them, on the first, on the general principles of private international law, then of the system of arbitration law, the joint interest of the party, and the enforceability of the award. And which means, in principle, you look largely at the New York Convention and see is there any problem with the recognition or which, which where the non-application of the insolvency law would, in the end, make the award open to challenges. And there are two people who have written their PhD thesis on it, two Germans, which come up with a complete list of conflict of law provisions but if you want to hear that, those conflict of law provisions which have been developed from this New York Convention, just a second. The further questions will be answered at the next <laughs> conference we're having jointly then in Brazil. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Stefan. Thank you, Professor Brisangelo. Professor Brisangelo shows us uh, how things work inside on Citral, it's an insider view. And Professor Stefan demonstrated now, exactly now that there is nothing in law that can become more complicated if you apply private international law. So uh, we have a lot to discuss. I'm opening for, for questions. Um, Professor Bork, please. Yeah, thank you for two very exciting uh, talks. I must say I learned a lot. And I, I just will restrict myself to adding a little bit information to what Sh Stefan Kröll said. Every, every, I can underwrite everything you said, so relax. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just, it's just an observation from the ins international insolvency point of, of view. Um, international insolvency law is uh, built on the principle of universalism. And that means um, every state or most states claim that the effects of national insolvency laws have worldwide effect, which we can call outgoing universalism. That is what the national court claims for its decision. And it is also expected that other countries recognize these effects worldwide, which we, can, which we can call incoming universalism. The uh, irritating thing is that the principle of universalism is not recognized in Switzerland, and also not in Norway and, and some other countries. Um, and I think that is why the Swiss uh, court grasps the straw of um, capacity, because that has nothing to do with, with international insolvency law. If, if Switzerland would have recognized international insolvency law and the principle of universalism, they would have been bound to accept the effects of the opening of Polish insolvency proceedings as laid down in Polish law. And the only exception we can find is Article 18 EIR you mentioned uh, in your talk, which is contrary to the principle of universalism. Uh, 
and simply it, it makes sense when it comes to state court proceedings because if we have a Swedish insolvency procedure, a German court can only apply German civil procedure law regarding the interruption or stay of, of proceedings in Germany. But I doubt whether it makes sense for arbitration proceedings because arbitrators can apply every, each and every law. They are good enough to do that. And uh, I think that was um, yeah, something that gave room for arbitration worldwide and, and tried not to make it too complicated. But it's difficult to justify this exception in Article 18. Nevertheless, we have it, and that makes it easier. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that you agreed. Yeah, I was already worried yeah, that I missed out on something on international insolvency law. No, but um, you said we are looking at universalism, and that's why I quoted the English judge here, which said, yeah, in principle, we're looking at universalism, but not 100%. Yeah, there may be different considerations. They said we have an international policy, and the principles we apply balancing between the uh, cases we enforce arbitration agreements, and on the other hand, we say that uh, these um, invalidation claims uh, are not uh, arbitrable. That applies on the national level, but if someone else comes with the same, largely the same approach, maybe we give more weight to then the public policy of uh, enforcing arbitration agreements. Yeah, so I found that quite interesting. That's why I used that case. Yeah. Um, that the judge was so clear on that. And two, one, two, three questions here. Then, there, yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you. Um, I've got a question. I don't, I don't want to wait until September, so it uh, <laughs> goes to, to Stefan. Um, but you said, uh, I found that very interesting, you said that there are tendencies to create special conflicts on rule, uh, co conflict of law rules for arbitral uh, tribunals. Um, but wouldn't that run contrary to the attempt to have an equivalence between arbitration and state court proceedings? And, and would it then be necessary to have different characterizations, or would it be possible to have different characterizations when it comes to the arbitral proceeding and an appeal before a state court against the arbitral award? Wouldn't, that, couldn't there be any conflicts in that respect once you have special conflict of, rules, conflict of law rules for the tribunal? Um, very valid point, yeah. Um, the moment you have different rules, there's always the th threat that in the end you may render an award which may not be enforced in a particular jurisdiction. And that's also why the Vivendi case is so interesting, yeah, that the Polish court said, yes, we have that provision which we would definitely have applied if it was in Poland, but now if we enforce it, at, at, if we are in the enforcement stage, we say, okay, it's, we nevertheless enforce the award. Yeah? And that's how also these two PhD theses develop the uh, special conflict roles they advocate. Uh, these are the conflict roles based on looking at potential enforcement of the award, what would affect the enforceability of the award. And they would say, okay, arbitrability is governed largely by the law of the state where the arbitration takes place. Because if you... If under this law the dispute is not arbitrable, you will be able to set aside the award, and normally awards which have been set aside in the country of origin, with very few exceptions, will not be enforced because you have a special defense under the New York Convention. Um, the idea underlying these special conflict of law rules was you want to maintain arbitration. Uh, the, the problem always arises if the uh, law at the place of insolvency uh, is stricter, is giving less leeway to arbitration than the law at the place of arbitration. The other way around is not so much a problem. Uh, and the underlying idea is we want to give more leeway to arbitration to enforce the agreement of the parties to go to arbitration because 
at least the place of arbitration has the impression that this dispute can go to arbitration and arbitration can play a role there and the party selected that particular place. And then we hope that at the enforcement stage, the court at the, enforce, uh, at the place of insolvency will recognize that under the New York Convention like the Polish court did. Because then you have an additional public policy which may play a role way in in the balancing of the various public policies, and that is the public policy of having a decision, an award which has been rendered to enforce that award, not to null it. Thank you very much. That was truly fascinating, and I agree we could be here the whole day. Now, I agree that part of the problem that we are facing is due to the existing territorialism in some jurisdictions, and to some extent, if cross-border insolvency law was as developed as cross-border arbitration law is through the New York Convention, we would maybe not have the same level of conflict. And from what I see in here, I don't think that we need to harmonize the outcome of the analysis. That is, we don't need to regulate in each state whether they allow arbitration or not in the context of insolvency. At least we need, what we need is a uniform method of analysis. That is, the conflict of laws dimension is what needs to be um, harmonized. Because at the moment, arbitrators and courts in different capacities in arbitration-related cases or insolvency arbitration cases, they just operate under different methodological um, frameworks. And that's what creates the discrepancy and the cost and the uncertainty. So what UNCITRAL, where, where UNCITRAL has a, a tremendous opportunity is to create that framework for arbitrators as well as for national courts. And in that sense, instead of trying to build the insolvency within the current categories of arbitrability, arbitration agreement, capacity, relying on an insolvency-specific um, conflict of laws rule would seem the favorable approach, um, at least from, because at least it, it would eliminate the whole problem of characterization. You would not need to characterize the problem. You simply say, if, an if arbitration commences, this is the law that governs the effects of it. And maybe you can distinguish between arbitrations that are pending and no arbitrations in the same way as the European regulation does. So, uh, if, if we are trying to have a, a harmonized conflict of law system which avoids characterization, then we also avoid the current uh, value-driven characterization, which is we're at the moment pleading the characterization that confirms the interest of our clients or that confirms the interest that I want to reach as a court or as an arbitrator. We just need to avoid that instrumentalist use of characterization. So, and with this I conclude, if UNCITRAL were to take a step on this direction, the question is, do we just create from scratch a conflict of laws method for arbitrators as well as courts when dealing with insolvency matters? Or do we go through the applicable law regime that Working Group 5 is starting to work on? Um, and what we have at the moment is already Article 20 of the cross-border insolvency model law, which already tells us you stay proceedings. So that de facto is a choice of law rule because it's telling us that doesn't matter what the Lex Concursus is saying, you recognize the foreign insolvency, you, you stay arbitrations, and then you decide whether you lift that stay or not. It's already telling you that it's the law of the place of arbitration that suspends the arbitration and lifts it. Uh, so I think this already, Article 20, it's indirectly a choice of law rule. I don't know whether um, that could be expanded to arbitrary tribunals instead of just creating a whole new conflict of law system. I'm just thinking out loud. I, there's no question, but I, it's just a reaction, and I apologize if I took longer. Thank you very much. I, I have a lot of questions and comments, so I, I, I was just trying to, to buy some time to see which one I was going to raise. But uh, I would to, uh, uh, like to uh, reflect on two points. The also a point raised here. Whether do we really want to have a dual system uh, which was distinguished between the litigation as also adversary proceedings and arbitration having the same aim also for the insolvency proceedings. Within that context, is that not maybe easiest just to say, well, why don't we apply in arbitration the same line of reasoning that we would apply if there was recognition of foreign bankruptcies and their effects on the pending litigations and non-pending proceedings? 
in that case, it would have been maybe pragmatic. But rather, I would say, also in the terms of uh, uh, having a, a little bit uniform approach with respect to court proceedings and arbitration. So not really uh, um, uh, forming the conflict of law rules which would be just for arbitration, but rather of the interaction between the pr legal proceedings and insolvency proceedings. And the second, I'm not going to, to misuse the, the time here, I just wanted to, to mention that I fully agree with any statement that characterization is absolutely no way out of this conundrum that we have seen in Vivendi, and that was more than obvious, a failure in both proceedings, in Switzerland and in England, to apply proper provisions. England courts also did not apply their own law on the state, automatic state of litigation, also in the previous case, not only in arbitration. So that's just to say that even when we have a uniform rules, unfortunately, we cannot really in ensure that uh, effects of foreign bankruptcy proceedings, insolvency proceedings, will be ensured. But no characterization is way out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Janelou, please. Yeah, yeah uh, allow me just to, just to make a few comments to some of the points that have been made. And uh, at the um, risk of sounding uh, trivial and trying to make everybody happy, uh, obviously we at Ancestral, we want arbitration to be widespread and efficient. We want insolvency to be also efficient as well. And of course we get into this conflict because there are different philosophies, I don't need to repeat that. Um, uh, I wish my fr our friends in the Hague Conference a lot of success with the Judgments Convention, but we're way far from that being a global reality. So the global reality for settling uh, private disputes is the New York Convention, which is an extremely powerful tool, but should not be misused against the objectives of insolvency law. And that's the compromise we need, the balance that needs to be achieved. The problem of the, uh, the current face is that the current lack of clarity in this area allows a party that wants to undermine the objectives of an insolvency proceeding country A to use the New York Convention to grab assets in other countries where that, that proceeding has not yet been recognized, and the court had bound by the very narrow possibility that the New York Convention gives that, that court not to give effect to that uh, uh, arbitral award, even if that arbitral award would be completely contrary to the letter and the spirit of the applicable uh, insolvency law to the main insolvency proceedings. And this is where we have to see how can you find a solution for that. I personally am not disinclined towards the idea of having special uh, conflicts of law rules for arbitrators because also we need to get away from the old fashioned notion that they automatically apply the, 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 the PIL rules of the seat of arbitration, which may be just completely arbitrary and unrelated to the subject matter of the dispute and that perhaps would be a sort of transnational set of conflict of law rules. But when it comes to the content, I probably say, if I look at it from the angle of the uh, promotion of universalism or modified universalism from an uh, ancestral perspective, the rule for, for, for conflict of laws for arbitration should be one that promotes very much the, uh, the, uh, and upholds the core values of the, of the applicable insolvency law. And that would not allow that you, by using an arbitral proceeding that is uh, detached from that, that you, you, can, uh, you can undermine the objectives of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of that. You cannot just leave it at the moment for the arbitral tribunals to, to, to decide that freely. And, uh, and even though I'm not supposed to be criticizing existing law in any country or region, uh, Article 18 of the EU regulation is just not the ideal solution for this because it really opens the door for parallel proceedings for, for conflicting results. This cannot be, cannot be the aim. Uh, perhaps a special rule, rules on, on applicable law, either by that way or through clarifying uh, within insolvency law, that was certainly uh, welcome. But in any event, more clarity here is, is needed. Also, if you want arbitration to work efficiently within insolvency. But also in that, you, special in civil law jurisdictions, court would have to, to learn to dialogue better with the, with the arbitral tribunals and, and let's see whether we can have a workable framework for that. Thank you. And, and as far as insolvency re regulation is a matter of public policy, and it's impossible to have one pattern for every country. And correct me if I, I'm wrong, I think that proposal 
of a, 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 a model of insolvency have been discussed in or something like that in 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 Anuncetral. So uh, we have to deal with different regulations anyway in in procedures maybe we we, we can have um, uh, standard solution for procedures but um, the insolvency rules will probably ver vary according to the jurisdiction. Any suggestion? Any more questions? No? So um, I'd like to thank you both, both of you, for uh, two brilliant expositions. Brilliant expositions that brought us, uh, and, and the first expositions as well, that brought us a lot of, of doubts and, and uh, made us have our, uh, new questions, what's really good, and, and really want to, to, to be here again. And I, I will consider close this panel. And so Professor Bohr can, can finalize the event. Thank you very much. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, a few closing remarks, but uh, rest assured, only a few. Uh, it's only to thank several persons. First of all, a, a big thank you to our speakers who have enriched our day with very distinguished talks and have triggered vivid and insightful fruit-bearing discussions. I think uh, it was really in very efficient day of discussing this topic. Secondly, I would like to thank our sponsors, the law firm of uh, CMS Hasche Siegle, um, the insolvency law firm of uh, Flöter and Wissing, and of course, uh, Matt Arp, who sponsored our uh, event today. Thank you very much. And I'm not forgetting our video team without these two people, this event would be less uh, successful. Martin Meyer and Laura Dinze, thanks a lot for helping us today with the technical um, challenges. And the last thing I have to announce is that drinks are ready downstairs, so please follow me this door. <laughs> <laughs>